Initiating podcast download. Prepare yourself. Put on your spandex. Lace up your boots. Wrap your wrists. Hide your razor blade. Head to gorilla position. Grease up your hair. Apply baby oil. Okay, apply more baby oil. Get into gimmick. Keep your ears open and your mouth shut. Have fun and be safe out there, brother. Welcome to I'm on Wrestling. Now your host, Gregory Iron. Hello once again. Welcome to another edition of Iron on Wrestling. This is episode blah, blah, nine. Blah. I am your host, Gregory Iron. Gregory Iron. What's your name? I'm Aaron Bauer. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not the Alpha One Wrestling Alpha Male Champion. I am. I won it on Sunday. You are, yeah. yeah I yeah. won it on Sunday in the main event against But I'm Cody looking Durst. at the beautiful belt right now. The beautiful championship. It is a very it's nice It's in front of my face. Yeah. As we record this. Yes. Only because yo ass won it. I did. Sunday, as I just said. Yes. Kobe Durst, main event. Very stacked card. A lot of pressure on You're me. stacked. And, okay. No, uh, I mean, I do have a very nice developed chest, but that takes uh, years of hard work and determination in the gym. As you drink a white claw. What are you, a teenager? Yep. Okay. Actually, it's illegal for teenagers to drink, so I probably shouldn't say that. I don't know what you're talking about right now. What? You're way off. <laughs> okay. But I, I would... may not be in as uh, good a shape as you, uh-huh. but I just want to put this out there. Sure. I've been gaining weight for a role in a movie. <laughs> okay. What, what role is that? Well, uh, uh, I'm gaining weight for for this movie that I'm that I'm going to watch. Oh, okay. Yeah. All so. right. Well, you you keep that up. Are you what, you watching it on Disney Plus? That's been the hot topic all nope. week. I hate Disney. Oh, whoa, what? Let, oh. Yeah, let's get real. You're getting a lot of backlash here. I hate Disney. Why do you hate Disney? I hate, uh, what's that movie with Simba or whatever? <laughs> the the Lion, Lion King? King? F Pre- that movie. Pretty famous movie. Bleep that movie. Whoa, come on, man. What do you no, I don't like it. I, I think the heel's too strong. Come uh, on, it's man. bad. It's bad. I just don't like it. You're I don't like bad. the way they go about things. And, uh, I, yeah. I'm, I'm going to lose so many listeners because you hate the Lion King. F the Lion King. What the, f- oh my God. What, what else I? is next? What do you got for me? What do you want, Bambi? How could you Bambi, where the mother dies? You know, Disney. Produced- I hate Disney. Disney, produced- except for Toy Story. You good? Toy Story is great. I love but Toy Disney Story. Disney produced. I cry at cartoons. Toy Story. I watched Toy Story four, yeah. with my three boys the other night, <laughs> and it was a point where we had the lights off. We we're all kind of just watching the movie. It was late night. We we're eating popcorn, whatever. And I look over, and I'm pretty sure. Two out of my three boys were crying as I was crying. And then uh, my oldest, who's almost 14, Xavier, looks at me and he goes, Dad, I... they did it to me again. Okay. Yeah, I'm crying. I'm sorry. It wasn't Toy Story. It was Disney in general because Disney is magical. F Disney. You're being a piece of garbage. No, I hate Disney. I'm well, sorry, Wilda. I'll tell you what. If uh, Disney's bought a lot of properties, if they want to buy this podcast, I'm going to sell. And you're going to be a Disney property. Though well, then I'll love Disney. I'm pretty positive. Disney, I'll show for Disney. Disney will not be buying this podcast anytime soon. There's a lot of swearing. Uh, not we're gonna, anymore. We're going to have to tone that down. <laughs> All right. Uh, I don't know what that was. It, like an idiotic dinosaur? I don't know what kind of sound that was. Like a dying ter- pterodactyl? Uh, anyways. That's my Mickey. <laughs> Jesus. So episode nine. We hey have, guys, okay. I'm Mickey. That's a terrible impression. Don't ever do that again. Uh, oh hell yeah! All right, <laughs> you you don't have a good Austin at all. Half the time it sounds like you're Asian. I don't understand what somebody you're doing. once said. I sound like Terry Funk. That's when I do the Austin impersonation. Very much incorrect. <laughs> Anyways, we're going to talk about some Mickey three sixteen jazz. We're going to get into some stuff here in a little bit, but wanted to talk a little bit about the guests that we're going to have. 
coming up on the episode today. That would be Dan Housen. Very popular, very relevant right now. He's gotten himself over through experimentation, if you will, with his character. He's been around for seven years, and it, all of a sudden now, Dan Housen is catching on Housen based on his own language, Housen, where he kind of adds Housen to everything, Housen. And weak. He, whoa, what's weak? You. I'm very strong. Doing all the Housen stuff. I'm strong with the NWO. I would never do that. Hey, I just want to tell you something right now, though. What's that? I know you're talking about Disney Plus, but I've been watching Netflix lately. Okay. You know what I'm watching? <clears throat> what are you watching? Fuller Housen. Yeah. Oh. Did I just do that? You just did it. Yeah. It's catching on, isn't it? Yeah, it yeah. sure is. Yeah, he's a popular guy, Dan Housen. I've been watching Full Housen, too. Love that, Some Dan re- Housen. Regular cable. Regular. It only took you five years to watch Full House. Fuller House. Fuller Housen. Yeah. Yeah. You like it, though. Well, I do love it. Who do you find more attractive, Stephanie or DJ? Matt. I mean, uh... <laughs> All right, I guess that's an option, too. Steve. I mean, a lot of people like Matt. A lot of people like Steve. But okay. uh, we're going all over the place. We've talked about Disney Plus randomly, and then you somehow brought up Netflix, which is a dying form of media now that Disney Plus exists. No one cares about Netflix. F Disney. Everyone loves Disney. Everyone loves Dan Housen, and we're going to talk about him a little yeah. bit. But a little thing that I alluded to was the thing that we talked about in the interview with Dan Housen was uh, – he went through several incarnations of Dan Housen. You know, right. he was Donovan Dan Housen, and then he was doing this Kid Gorgeous character, and then uh, what? He yeah, his name was Kid Gorgeous, okay. and uh, there was a couple other nicknames he went through. But uh, he, when I met him a couple years ago, he was just Donovan Dan Housen, and he was trying to figure out who he was. And that's the thing that we really hammered home in this podcast interview was the fact that like I I love that he he stuck with it and just started doing the things that made him happy and entertained him and now his character is getting over with everyone and people are are getting behind the character on social media he's always putting up good content and stuff for people to retweet and watch and uh i want to kind of touch on character development with you because you're a guy that's helped me with character stuff over the years and you were in the business way before i was and uh not way before way i mean you are very much an old man at this point but Mm -hmm. uh you, uh, you've helped me with character development and gave me solid storyline ideas and tips and tricks. And you've helped so many guys that have come through PWO and Prime Wrestling and AIW in the Ohio area. And uh, I know when you got into the business, you started out as this commissioner, Commissioner Aaron Simmons, your real name. Yep. But over the years, you went through these incarnations yourself of like different characters. So like kind of what I wanted to talk to you about today is like when you got into wrestling, what did you think your character was going to be? What did your character become? And how did you understand and realize that depending on the situation and the times, your character needed to grow and change? Well, I was Aaron Simmons. I used my shoot name at first because I felt like it would draw more fans to the first show I promoted Mm -hmm. with my trainer. So I was from Lorain, Ohio. I wanted to use the name I was known as in Lorain, Ohio. Um, I don't know, whatever, it was okay. I, I, In my mind, when I was younger, I thought it was going to be a combination of Hulk Hogan and Taz. Which is a ridiculous combination. No, it's a great combination. I, I, I don't know about that. Okay. Well. Why that combination? I don't know. Hogan was the ultimate baby face. Taz could wrestle. I thought I was going to you know, combine both. And I love Taz's promos. Yes. So... I thought that like I could combine the two and then be that guy. Give me a Hulk Hogan slash Taz promo right now. What does that sound like? <laughs> Let me tell you something, brother. Brother, you don't even know me. I'll choke you out. I feel like there's not a lot enough Hogan in that, though. You didn't let me finish. You cut me off. Keep you going. pardon the interruption on me. <laughs> Sorry. Keep going. Ashes to ashes. Dust to dust. When all the smoke clears, in Hulk we still trust. Okay. What you're gonna do when the 24 inch pythons run wild on you? I'll choke you out, motherfucker. Zabu! <laughs> okay, now, 
I don't know. <laughs> no, hold on, hold on, stop. There stop. was a vision in my head, but I was like, no, 16. no, 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 stop, stop. Now, suck I don't, it. I don't know if you've ever cut a Taz Hogan promo out loud until right now. Do you realize after doing that? Yeah. Best? Probably, probably why that combination would not have worked. <laughs> right, right, right. Okay. I realized that early on. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh-huh. So that's when I figured out for me and my size and my character and um, uh, my skill set. I wasn't going to be a wrestler. I was going to be a badass wrestler. I was going to be the uh, main champion wrestler, the big baby face. I was going to be uh, maybe the slimy piece of shit heel. So I kind of altered and went with like a Fonzie state athletic commissioned commissioner referee type of deal. And Shane Douglas, I wanted to do because I like I, I love Douglas promos. I love how he enunciated things, uh, all that kind of stuff. And I loved uh, Fonzie that he could come in and just like reverse things and change rules as it went. And I loved ECW. So I switched there. When do you find out tr- through your travels through Ohio and Pennsylvania and Michigan and stuff that you you need to kind of evolve the character a little bit and uh, have to be open to change the character and tweak the character? Because some guys, as you've known over the years, come through and, and they think with their that their character is this way and only this way, and there's no changing it. Like, right. why do you th- why do you think it's like uh, you had it in your brain like this is okay to change and adapt? Uh, early 2000s, I started managing this dude, Brandon X. He was like a thug character. Um, maybe like a guy who'd been to prison, stuff like that. Yeah. So I happened to have a policeman's uniform, a security uniform, and a bulletproof vest, stuff like that. So I thought, like, if he was coming out as the prisoner, I could be the prison guard. And so I used that in several different areas because it seemed like that was what people wanted. Uh huh. And so uh, I adapted and, and, and did that. Also in areas, uh, Brandon X was kind of the same character. And I wanted to try something different. So I was like the white rapper. I was uh, white gold. Great name. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. And I tried that. And I did that for a little bit. I was part of a faction called, it was with uh, uh, three African-American gentlemen. Uh-huh. And we called ourselves the Dark Horsemen. <laughs> okay. So One of you just a shade lighter. Yeah. Well, but, however, I wore a jacket that said Africa on the back of it. <laughs> with, 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 it was, it was uh, green, red, yellow, and black. Boy, have times changed. Yep, yep, yep. yep. Yeah. Uh, white can, gold yeah because I, I with the africa jacket i got approached by chandler biggins from aiw mm-hmm. right when they uh, they had just ran their first show and he came to me at a show in cleveland can't remember wasp maybe it was for oh god wasp they oh. needed an extra guy in their battle royal hold on no wasp okay uh, bad news I don't know why we're bringing up Wasp on this podcast. Wasp st- stood for Wrestling All Star Promotions. Yes, probably one of the worst promotions I've worst ever. All Star promotions. I thought <laughs> yeah, it should have been no? worse. Yeah, but like it was a local thing that kind of ran around the time that uh, I started in 2006, and for a short period of time, there was actually a faction called. Let me I'm, something like five live crew or something like it oh, was really yeah. stupid. And it was like the faction was a young Gregory Iron. OK, a young Johnny Gargano. Yeah. A young Zoe Sky, who at the time was known as Angel Dust. Oh, my God. Really? Uh, a young, I don't know anything about this. A young breaking Math- news. A young Matthew Justice, who people what? probably know from AIW and Game Changer Wrestling. All quality people. Okay, go ahead. Then quality there, workers. There was uh, a guy by the name of Johnny Blaze. Who okay, ran the promotion. Uh, uh, okay, that's so where it so, ends. So he's so he's the promoter, and he's in this faction <laughs> with these 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 young talented kids, and then and the, and the guy the guy who helped him run the promotion, yeah. who went by the name of. Dirty Sanchez. Yes. Now, now I want I you. I remember to, that guy. I, I want you to do the math here. 
What's the name of the faction? Five Live Crew. Okay, there are definitely six of us in this yes! group. Yes! <laughs> so it makes no But Five and Live rhyme. <laughs> it rhyme. And you're in Wasp. But, but there's there's six of us in I, this faction. I get it, but... Yeah. So, uh, so that's... The Four I, Horsemen a lot I, of times had five in it. So. And, and I, want, I want to point something out, and this this really goes in sync with what we're going to talk about in a second. Mm, uh, there was I a guy by the name of uh, Barry Sagittarius. Yes, who Remember did the him? promos. And I'll never yeah. forget, I had just started wrestling, and he claimed that, uh, he, I think me and Matthew Justice had to do a promo um, for, for what he claimed was going to be on public access. They were getting okay. public access. And he was telling me that they were going to do something very unique and do this promo and like keep zooming in and out of my face, and they were yeah. going to play... Uh, Pulp Fiction music in the background, oh. and 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 as he's saying that, I go never heard of this, and, and I go, oh, like like on ECW, he's like, yeah, 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 but 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 not the same, you know? Yeah. And I remember thinking to myself, like, good okay. bet, Barry Sagittarius. And, and so uh, I feel like I just sounded like me with a sped up voice. No, 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 okay. you sound and, like him. And, and so, uh, yeah, so he he really didn't have this idea of how to do anything different than what he had saw on TV. Instead of taking inspiration from something, he was just blatantly copying it. So like. I, I kind of went off on a tangent. You were saying you started talking about uh, Wasp in general, and then I just started talking about how terrible it is. But um, it was great. You Chandler Biggins wanted you to help with Wasp, or what was the situation? No, no. And, it because, was a Wasp show. Okay. And I just happened to be at a merch table with like these AIW guys. Okay. Thorne Biggins, uh, uh, Nick, uh, Fat Nick, I think his name was. And then uh, there was a girl there that was like the AIW girl who uh, kept flashing me. Anyway, um, <laughs> I got it on tape somewhere. You'll have to yeah. see it. Anyway, so uh, so Biggin says, look, uh, they want you to be in the show um, as Officer Fresh. So you're going to walk down to the ring with this girl in this battle royal because they need an extra guy. Okay. Um uh, so you're going to get thrown out right away. But after that, I want to talk to you because we like you for AIW. And we want you to be something different. We want you to be an agent, kind of like uh, how Paul Heyman is to yeah. Brock Lesnar. But we want you to do this with this guy we call the Thrill Billy. Okay. And uh, we're going to call you Agent Aaron something. Yeah. And I loved AIW. Mm -hmm. I only knew them from, they did one show and they had these legit Ticketmaster tickets printed out. Very uh, innovative. Cut, right. Uh, innovative, cutting edge for the time. Ahead yes. of its time, you know? So Ticketmaster, it said Ticketmaster on the tickets and then underneath it, it said presented by and then it would have the name of the talent. So like the tickets they got me once I got booked. Yeah. They wanted me to sell 10 tickets, whatever. It said uh, AIW Absolution presented by Agent Aaron Bauer. Nice. I, I I was done, man. Like, once they showed me that, I'm all in forever yeah, yeah, with yeah. you guys. And it looks this legit. This is legit. You're selling them to other people. They're yeah. like, whoa, wait, what? And we're at Peabody's it? where... I had seen many concerts of underground bands, whatever. So they wanted me to be an agent. I had to have a three-piece suit, which I went and got. Mm -hmm. And I had to represent my athlete, my protege, whatever, uh, the way kind of Paul Heyman would Brock Lesnar. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. I brought out an old phone, an old cell phone mm -hmm. from like the early 90s, maybe. One of those big, Zach Morris cell phones. Sure. Um, even though we were already, you know, in the two thousands, yeah, I was, you know, going to hit people with the cell phone because they wanted me to be that character. And I feel like it's almost like better heat in two thousand five that you're using this big cell phone. That, exactly, <laughs> that clearly is not you. You're not making phone calls on it. Right, right, so right. Why do you have I'm it, just right? hitting people with yeah, it. Yeah, so, yeah, So, so that, the referee would know. Like, well, what do you have the cell phone for? You're not calling people. Yeah. You're hitting people with Th this it. This is the time of like track phones. Stuff, right. You know, like these tiny little which shitty phones. Is what I had at the phone. time. Yeah. And which is how I got my bookings because <laughs> I had to go to the store, to the Dollar General, and re up my minutes in order to catch bookings. Ridiculous. So, yeah, I did that character. Uh, I did a mask character. I was a Mexican wrestler named El Fresho, even though I was fresh, you know, uh, in certain places. 
then like I wore this Mexican mask and it was El Fresho yeah. who wasn't the same person, but was, you yeah. know, you know how that goes. Dusty Rose did it. Uh, Brian Pillman did his yellow dog, whatever. And so basically you figured out <coughs> very quickly that by being able to adapt and change and just explore ideas with your characters that it made you a more valuable performer, right? Right. I could do anything that anybody wanted. Yeah, and I think that's very important. And, and so because of that, you know, when we just talked about how Barry Sagittarius had these very unoriginal ideas for promos and right. stuff and character ideas. Um, Reminds as, me as, of, like, Mad Justice. As, as a sidebar, I, <laughs> I remember outside of a Wasp show one time, me and Johnny were – in the car getting ready to go and Barry Sagittarius who is a fucking weirdo he was standing outside of his car and said no 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 guys don't 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 go yet don't go yet I gotta I gotta play you something and then he proceeded to play like all of these random WWF songs very loud in his car on his car CD player uh, while he danced to them outside of his car and me and Johnny who were just young 19 20 year old kids at the time just were sitting there <laughs> uncomfortable like looking at him while he like danced what? to like the wrestlemania guitar theme from like what? you know like wrestlemania six or seven yeah 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 it was it was really fucking weird but that's totally off topic so yeah. he was completely unoriginal but because you had such good ideas not only were you valuable as a performer, that but you were valuable in terms of helping other people. And like I said earlier, you helped me so much in terms of like figuring out my character and like well, different you. things I could do like as a heel, which yeah. was very hard for me to do at first, or different promo ideas, different ways to set up stories and stuff. Uh, I mean, that's why I wanted you on board for this podcast. Right. So over the years, how did you f take what you learned as a performer and then use that to help other performers behind the scenes? Well, look, um, I mentioned Matt Justice earlier, and that was because that was a guy I thought would never get it. Yeah. Okay. And then all of a sudden one day, and I don't know if it was from me or from just working more shows and working out of town, whatever. Matt Justice got it. And he became, you know, a guy that was valuable to companies. Yeah. He ended up in uh, FCW. Yes, Is that he right? Was, he was signed for a little bit in 2011. Okay. And then I don't know what happened there, and I don't care right now. All I'm saying is Matthew Justice went from somebody who sucked and didn't know anything about his self and his character to somebody who became really good and really in tune with who he was portraying as a character. Yeah, well, and you know, Matt always... Matt is Matt. I've, I've known Matt for a long time. Like, I, I don't know if a lot of people realize this, you know, me and Matt were very, very close when training began. Like, yeah, I remember you cried. I cried when in the uh, ring when when they announced that he got signed. By yeah, WWE. when he got signed to WWE, I remember we we, we wrestled. Uh, it was like one of his last independent matches. And, uh, I love you, man. Okay, we teamed together, and uh, I cried. I'm very uh, synonymous with crying in pro wrestling. I don't know why I get very emotional with oh, that shit. Your baby. But uh, yeah, I guess. But uh, me and Matt actually started. Um, traveling together uh right. we were in the same class with jt lightning and then when johnny became the trainer you know oftentimes i talk about how a lot of the times it was just me and johnny at training sometimes it would just be like me johnny and, and matt justice and mm -hmm. uh and other times uh i just mentioned her earlier in in the five live crew, five live crew that had six people uh uh nikki aka <laughs> Nikki, aka Zoe Sky, aka Angel Dust, like she would, she would oftentimes be one of the only people at training too. But me and Matt were close, and we traveled together. And for a long time, to get bookings, uh, you know, we were a tag team because yeah. for some reason in that, in that time, it was, it was more valuable uh, in like 2007 and eight. I felt to like just be a traveling tag team because like yeah. not a lot of guys, not a lot of guys were or like, and we were versatile in terms of like. But if you wanted us to work each other too, we would do that. But uh, Matt was always driven. And it wasn't surprising based on his work ethic as far as like in the gym and stuff. And uh, he knew his goal was WWE. So when he got signed, it was no shock. But like uh, he made some mistakes when he went to FCW. Maybe he wasn't exactly ready. But when he came back, I think like over the past few years, especially Matt has proven that like he's willing to adapt and change and do things to stand out. I mean, he's been yep. doing some crazy shit in terms of in ring stuff and, and, Obviously, it's shining a spotlight on him. Yeah, uh, it reminds me of uh, maybe um, Ricky Shane Page. Yes. 
Ricky Shane Page is another guy who's like really coming to his own, over, especially over the last few years. Somebody I had to beg, plead, and completely convince to take a certain role in a company, uh, which was Prime Wrestling. Yeah. Is that what it was then? Yep. And Joe Dombrowski wanted him to be this uh, psychotic lunatic character that had just come out of uh, the mental ward. Yeah, something like that. Well, well, like I guess it's important to, to mention, not a lot of people realize this. You know, Ricky started out basically as a masked character named Christian Faith. Right. And when the idea was, was it was Ricky's idea, he, he didn't want to wear the mask anymore. Mm-hmm. He wanted to try to grow and develop and change. And everybody that knew that character was over as Christian Faith, um, they didn't think because of the way Ricky looks facially, looks right. very young. Yep. Uh, he can't grow facial hair. Like no one thought that he could get over without a mask, even as far as once the mask came off and he was getting over without the mask on, we were working for AAW in Chicago for Danny Daniels. Danny Daniels made him put the mask back on yeah. because he thought Ricky would never get over right. as Ricky Shane Page, which is like ridiculous because he's incredibly over now. Yeah. Okay, so in, in AAW one day, uh, Ricky was approached uh, by B.J. Whitmer, who said, Ricky, I talked to Japan about you. They're interested. But they want you to, like, grow a beer or something. Oh, this is a real thing? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Swear to God. And Ricky was like, uh, I'm going to tell you right now, I can't grow one. <laughs> okay. I just, I can't grow facial hair. <laughs> And so BJ was like, well, could you put the mask back on? Japan is willing to book you if you put the mask back on. And Ricky said, no. I will stand by my convictions. I'm strong in my opinions. I feel like I'm a stronger character without the mask. And BJ said, well, they feel like you look like a baby face and not a baby face as in a good guy. Yeah, he has a he's, baby's face. Yeah. <laughs> like like that. Yeah, you have a like baby's he, face. He's a six foot four man with the baby with, with the face of a uh, toddler. Right. Yeah. And Ricky said, OK, well, you know, I guess uh, we'll agree to disagree. I think is how it went. I mean, Ricky's very boring. Ricky's dream was to go to Japan. He would not change himself. To go to Japan. Now, it sounds like a sad story. Yeah. However, Ricky has come so far in evolving himself from just like a dude with a baby face, like a good looking young kid or whatever. Yeah. To now he's wrestled the way that he's supposed to, evolved himself the way he's supposed to, to the point that he's in Japan. I mean, All the time now. Am as I right? We're, as we're recording this, he's on a flight to Japan for yeah. for another week. And this is his third Another. He's yes. it's isn't the first time. This is his third time going to Japan. His third this year. tour of Japan. Yeah. And, and and so and and that's an important thing to bring up. I'm glad you mentioned that because you know, we talk about how you have to have this ability to adapt and change. Now, on the surface, uh, you might hear that and think, Well, what an idiot. If he would have just put the mask on, he could have went to Japan maybe five That's years not ago. how he adapted and changed. He did adapt and change. That would that would but been- not the way that maybe Japan and the office in Japan wanted him to. Yeah. He did it on his own, on his own merits, changed himself. I'm sorry if I keep hitting the table. It's fine. But uh you know, I'm passionate about this because this is a story unlike we have heard in wrestling, maybe before. I mean, I'm sure it's happened with other people at times. But seriously, Ricky has gone from this uh, this baby face, no hair on his face, no mask on his face. They wanted him to have that. Yeah. Uh, didn't cut promos. Yeah. He and I got into some arguments about this. Yeah, I, I remember. He was an AIW champion, which I pushed hard for. He got the belt. I asked him to do promos. He wouldn't do promos. Yeah. You know, and and I don't know what's up with that, but immediately we took the belt off him. Yeah. Sorry, but if you're not going to cut promos, we can't use you in that role. Yeah. yeah. And and uh, now he, he was stubborn, and that's how he's going to be his whole life. But 
I will say this, true to himself. 100%. And, and He know, stayed true to himself. Yeah, and when, and when you talk about, again, like they wanted him to put on the mask and being able to adapt for like particular scenarios to make it work, like that might have been one of those cases where, especially in Ricky's mind, and clearly he's made it very apparent that um, – that might have been the case. It might have been a, a regression for him. Do you know what I mean? Like right. to go back back to that mass character, like it, it's it's like a de evolution. You know, you got to try to like adapt and change for the better. Going back to the mass character, I don't know if that would have done Ricky any favors as far as like growing and like learning how to like do things facially and like cutting better promos. Because when you're under when you're under that mask character, it's like you can only do so much. You know, his right. eyes weren't exposed with that mask, and his, his mouth, anything. You know, so it's like he was doing uh, cane shit, basically. Yeah, like yeah, the, yeah. The, he was the like doing the, the, head. A, the head tilt. Yeah. Oh, come on, man. We see that on WWE. We don't need to see that with you. Yeah. We yeah. saw we saw that on Monday Night Raw. And, and it's great because, like... We don't need to see the low-rem version. Like, it's funny because, like, Ricky's promos are so good now. Like, uh, the shit he can do in the ring's always been incredible. And people are, are just now seeing that, like, beyond the deathmatch stuff that, like, he... For a guy his size, like, the way he moves and everything. And just in general, like, I think he's built Ricky Shane Page... Uh, not not the the man, but the performer up to the point where it's like he doesn't need to cut a promo. Like that music hits that he comes out to, we can roll. And like, there's not a lot of guys you could say this about, especially on the indies. But like, he has like this aura and this charisma about him that when he comes to the ring, like he doesn't gotta say too much. You know, like like people just get behind him. There's something about him. And it, there were so many people that sold him short on this idea that Ricky Shane Page could get over, and he's one of the most over motherfuckers on the independents. Yeah, I'm very proud of him, and um. Happy he's stuck to his guns, and he's one of the rare cases of somebody who gets over on his own terms. And it was one of those things, though, too. Like, and you know, Ricky, as we said, kind of stubborn. He started Kinda. to say, he's, <laughs> he started to say, fuck it. I'm just going to yeah. do what I find entertaining. And that's what Dan Housen did. And I think right. that's why Dan Housen is so over the way he was, because it got to the point where he said, I'm not having fun wrestling. I'm going to I'm going to do one last thing in wrestling and I'm going to have fun doing it and all of a sudden it caught fire. It shouldn't be a shock though because those are the things that catch fire. It's like if you're happy doing it, other people will see that and it catches on. I think for me, you know, being a babyface in the beginning, it's very uh it was very cookie cutter. I'm this handicapped wrestler which makes yep. me stand out, but yep. I didn't know how to be anything other than Oh god, let's go. You were terrible. Let's go, baby. Right. You know, come on like cuz it's just like um, I didn't know how to show the real person who was people very... used to make fun of you in the back for doing that uh, thing when you come out and then you like shoot the gun. Or it wasn't even generic. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't even shooting the gun. But also, you know what? That was very important once people started pointing that out to me. It's like, yeah. like, because it was just me like pointing and shaking my finger. Yeah, that's what it people was. People would make fun of me, but that was right. one of the first instances where I thought to myself, I didn't even realize I was doing it. But it was one of those things where I'm like, wait, this is something that people know that I do yeah now I'm gonna just keep doing it and then like that kind of got the the wheels turning as far as like I need to do things that like stand out to people and right. that they remember you know and so that, what do you do now when you come out you don't point the finger or shoot the gun or whatever you're doing I, I right? still kind of do that but like not all the time it's not like as prominent I don't know but it's just, it's, it's just you, what? I don't know are you more confident in it or I don't get it because back then it looked like you were and I People say this a lot, but it looked like you were playing a wrestler. You like, I have to do something when I come out, and maybe you still do it sometimes. Yeah, but it's probably more natural now because you are a wrestler. Yeah, it's not like a conscious thing, and, and yeah. it, it's just like I, I feel the crowd, I feel the situation, and I like again, like when I started, it, it was like um, I felt like everything I was gonna do felt very set up in my brain you know yep. like like step by step can't do it word for word in a yep. promo and and you know i've talked i talk about this and a then lot. when the crowd switches on you what do you do yeah you you, You're, you can't you keep off. following script because i found that out yeah well I, I think a good example is so like um and i i alluded to it earlier you know like you helped me so much becoming a heel and uh i thank you for that because you just helped me in terms of like taking things that like made the gregory iron character good and simply flipping them mm -hmm. like like taking my real persona like when i see someone that like is actually being a fucking idiot and i make a comment about it in life it's like you know i'm looked at as this handicapped guy like mm -hmm. i looked at as, as though i have this disadvantage and that i'm less than well why is it that i'm in this incredible shape and that guy 
who's getting more than I am isn't. He's yeah. a, he's a schlub. He's not working as hard as me. Like, why can't Gregory Iron zero in on that and point that out? Like, I'm technically the disabled guy. So what's your excuse? Why am I more quote disabled than right. you are? You know, and that helped me so much. But another thing that I always talk about in seminars now, and I talk with young guys about, is an incident that I had with Al Snow in OVW in 2011, I believe. I went to Cole Cabana for advice uh, going into this OVW tryout back when you could actually pay for tryouts with OVW. And he kind of gave me a warning about Al Snow. I I guess Colt never really was the biggest fan of Al, and Al wasn't the biggest fan of Colt. And I told him some of the trainers that was going to be at OVW, and uh, Al Snow was not one of them. But he told me, as long as Al Snow's not there, you'll be okay. And so I go to this tryout. It was a two-day thing, and met all the trainers. So, like, Rip Rogers, uh, I think uh, Danny Davis, uh, Jim Cornette was there. Uh, I go into the promo room, and I, I'm told that I have this one-minute promo, babyface promo that I'm going to have to cut. And I'm standing in line, and I'm memorizing this promo word for word, every bit of it. I'm p- very confident in this promo. I've got it completely in my brain. Walk into this promo room, and... To my shock, Al Snow was behind the camera, who I haven't seen the whole time, and Cabana had warned me about. So in my head, I'm like, shit. But then I'm like, you know what? I got this promo down pat. Here we go. Red light goes on. Cut this promo one minute long. I think I I do 59 and a half seconds, so it's like spot on. Because I hear the critiques from some of the trainers going, don't waste one second of time. Because if you get one minute on WWE television, you need to use that one minute. You don't use 45 seconds because you've just wasted 15 seconds to self-promote yourself. You know what I'm saying? You don't go over on time because now you're taking up company time to promote yourself. Like, you try got to get as close to your mark as possible. So I do like 59 and a half seconds in front of Al Snow. I think I fucking killed it, right? And I'm waiting for the positive feedback and Al Snow looks me right in the eyes and he goes, yeah, I guess that was okay. But next time you come in here and cut a promo, why don't you try to do something from the fucking heart instead of that memorized bullshit you just did? <laughs> and I remember like, you know, he said like, get out of the room. And I walked out dejected. In my head, I was kind of like, well, fuck you, Al Snow. And I kind of yeah. had like this piss poor attitude about it. And I've always felt like, and I could be wrong, I've had interactions with Al over the years. And I've never told him about this experience that I had with him. I don't know if he remembers it. And I always kind of feel Al Snow hates me for some reason. Maybe that's just Al's demeanor sometimes. But uh, in general, as the years progressed, I realized Al doing that to me was probably the best thing that could have ever happened to me as a character, as a guy who cuts promos as a wrestler, because it made me reevaluate the way I thought of promos. And obviously I watched all the biographies and uh, read all the books about like guys bullet pointing promos and stuff. But I thought if I just memorize it, I'll be okay. But that day after dealing with Al, I thought to myself, I have to make this more of a conversation when I talk. Like, what is the point of the promo? Where am I going? Um, maybe I have a quote that I want to hit and base the promo around, but I'm not going to memorize word for word anymore. I'm going to talk in a promo like we're talking right now. And it changed the way I performed as a wrestler, like in general. Like, I just, I didn't have to think as much. And like, it wasn't as complicated to come up with promos anymore because I'm just going from the brain, you know? So right. like, uh, whether- That's I why things don't work on, you know, Hate to say this because we don't try to talk about this. Yeah, but that's why I feel like things don't work on Raw and SmackDown right now. I agree. I agree one hundred percent. These things aren't coming from the heart; they're coming from what somebody else's brain wrote for them. Yep. Mister Insanity, Toby Klein. Okay. Okay. He wrestled Al Snow at a show I was at, and I was managing Toby Klein. Okay. And I feel like Toby Klein and and uh, uh, Al Snow had a great match. And I felt like everything came together well. After the match, we went to the back, and Snow said to me, look, and he criticized Toby Klein for a minute. Yeah. Then he looked at me and he said, you were a half second late on your spot. A half second. Do you understand what that means? And I looked at him and I just said, yes, no, you know, whatever. And he said, seriously, you need to understand this. If you're a half second late, the whole match is out the window. Everything sucks now. Everything we put into the match, you were a half second late. You didn't get the reaction that we needed at that point in time. That's your fault. I thought, oh, man, this sucks. And then I thought, 
I didn't feel like I was half second off. I felt like I got the reaction. Yeah. So I was kind of pissed about it, and I was sitting in the locker room, and he come up to me. Al comes up to me later, and I had said to him, he said, uh, hey, anything you want to talk about? And I said, uh, just I came in wanting to get somebody from Impacts, uh, TNA, uh, their email or something to try to send a tape or anything, my highlight reel, whatever, my demo reel. And I also said, oh, boy, okay. And he looked at me, and I thought, he's really going to shit on me now. And he went, you were good. And you're probably something we could use in TNA. So here's these emails. And he gave me two emails, and it was like, you know, two guys that were in charge of hiring or whatever. And so um, as hard as he was on me in the beginning, like he ended with saying, like, I had potential. So, like, I don't know, the story comes, you know, kind of full circle or whatever. Yeah. Like, uh, you know. Yo, Al- uh, but I feel like how you felt, like, Al Snow was, like, shitty to you. Yeah. I felt like he was shitty to me. But in the end, we both feel like um, his advice or whatever was a positive thing. Yeah. And I want to make something clear. I've watched a lot of Al Snow seminars online, and I do not agree with a lot of things he says, to be yeah. honest. Um, but there are he does make good points on occasion. But like, like, for example, one point that he always talks about in like seminars, he, he always asks, tries to ask this trick question of like, what was the what was the best match at WrestleMania three? And, you know, uh, of course everyone says they probably say steamboat and savage, which I disagree with. They, they, they do. I'll tell you what I think it was. What do you think it was? I think it was Adrian Adonis, Roddy Piper. Okay. Okay. Well, that's a, that's a fair answer, but his, his, his answer is always no. Hogan, Andre. It's Hogan, Andre. Yeah. Because, because, uh, he yeah, drew, drew the, the most, most money. money. But yeah. like that, I think that's dumb because best match is not, and drew the most money is not the same thing, okay? But right. he tries to ask this trick question, like, like so, like things like that. I'm just like, okay, that's that kind of doesn't work. But in general, you know, Al's advice, whether he was actually trying to give me advice or just being a dick or whatever, it changed the way I looked at things. And like, same for you, you know. So, so right, uh, you know, whatever. He's been like around. Maybe I could have been a half second earlier. Yeah, yeah no, I don't know that it would have changed the complexity complexity of a match in front of 120 from, people. But, but but like but timing is very important. So I do yeah. agree with him in that aspect because sometimes when I do something with a guy and shit is like a half second off, it like eats at my soul. I don't know if you're- Wanted to touch on last week a little bit and the week I have coming up. Basically, uh, you know, we talked about timing is everything and and how we're our own biggest critics and how when things go wrong, they eat at your soul a little bit as a performer. If you if you really care about what you're doing, I know that's the case with me. And I can say with all honesty, for once, I had a whole week of wrestling where I can't think of anything that bothered me where I thought like "Eh, that could have been a little better here. This could have been a little bit better there. Like I actually felt like I put in some of the best performances of my career and uh honestly uh i had groups of people on every show that i was at this last week tell me that my match was the match of the night and uh as a performer as a professional wrestler that makes me very proud i did heavy metal wrestling their last of 50 weekly episodes for uh their heavy metal thunder show which airs live on twitch and uh was very proud to be a part of that worked with a gentleman by the name of clay roberts who was trained by Booker T at his reality of wrestling school. Clay Roberts, very talented young man, had the privilege to work with him. Uh, he, we had a great match. Did a little thing for Sabotage Wrestling on Saturday, this past Saturday, in uh, in a part of Texas, and I worked with uh, Erica Torres, and we had a great match that I'm really proud of. And, of course, I capped things off this past Sunday at Alpha One Wrestling in Hamilton in arguably, you know, the best match on the card and uh in my opinion one of my best matches of my career so if you have the opportunity when it's up on independent wrestling tv please go out of your way to watch final act 10 from alpha one wrestling and watch me versus kobe durst for the alpha male alpha one championship because it's something i'm very proud of but as far as this weekend goes i'm going to be in wrestling action on the road once again and you will be able to see me november 22nd at freelance wrestling in chicago illinois at logan square 
That will be a 9 p.m. bell time. Always a late show, but always a fun show. So if you're near Logan Square in Chicago, come out, see that event. There's going to be some cool names on the show like myself, Effie, Joey Ryan. Uh, we got Smiley Kylie Ray will be in action. Ethan Page, a host of others. And then on November 23rd, I will be back in Buffalo, New York for Empire State Wrestling. It's their biggest event of the year in Lockport, New York. Got a big, a lot of big names on the card. You got Devon Dudley making an appearance. Eddie Kingston, myself, and RJ City will be defending the Empire State Wrestling Tag Team Championships. Air Fox will be in the building. The Butcher and the Blade will be in action. Homicide will be making a rare appearance in upstate New York. <laughs> it's going to be a hell of a card. If you're in the area, come out and see it. But now, it's important to talk about our guest. Love that, Dan Housen. I had the opportunity to sit with him in a Denny's couple weeks ago and I feel like not a lot of people know the story behind Dan Howes and he doesn't do a lot of podcasts and I was happy that I was able to get get a uh, opportunity to sit down with him and you know even though we've been friendly over the years and we've had some conversations amongst each other and really bonded over a love of the Simpsons uh, we had our first really in-depth conversation we sat there for a good two hours before we started recording, just talked about life and everything and uh, really delved into the Dan Housen character, what makes it tick and how he got to the point where he's doing a character that he loves and people are getting behind and uh, the inspiration behind that character. We're going to talk about some promos and psychology and all that good stuff. You're going to love this interview. You're going to love that Dan Housen. So here we go. Me, Dan Housen, Denny's, dinner with Dan Housen. Let's go to that sweet, sweet interview got an important question for all you wrestling fans out there. Are you looking for hard-hitting wrestling journalism that is every bit as trustworthy and fact-based as professional wrestling itself? Well, then you've got no choice but to check out kfabenews.com. Kfabe News is unreal news about an unreal sport. It's the world's premier wrestling news site. Well, not exactly. I guess it's more like The Onion, but it's entirely about pro wrestling, You've surely seen some of the headlines. I'm talking like Hogan tells brother something, Cena visits injured self in hospital, or Lashley brashly lashes back at Backlash as a mismatch of trashy squash matches. They've even written a story about yours truly defeating Brock Lesnar for the Universal Championship at an indie show in Cleveland, and you never know, that might come true someday. But this isn't about me. This is about kayfabe news, and I strongly encourage you to check out all the stories on kfabenews.com. And hey, if you have some time, they've got a hilarious new YouTube show, which drops every Tuesday at youtube.com backslash kfabenews. And you know I have a great t-shirt collection. I've got a bunch of great shirts that I've gotten that support kfabe news, and you can get your very own just by going to prowrestlingtees.com backslash kfabenews. Kfabe news, remember, it's not fake news. It's unreal. <laughs> One and only, Dan Housen. Hello, hello. How are you? Very well. How are you? Good. I feel like, see, people are used to you talking like this, like a normal, a normal being. No, no, no. I do it every once in a while. I but... feel like you need to, you need to do the voice that everyone knows and loves. Hello. Yes, this is Dan Housen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How, how's, how's this Dan Housen doing? This Dan Housen is. Uh... Very sleepy, like a human. Yeah, like a human being. Like, you, you, are you just trying to pose like a human, or what are you doing, bro? No, 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 no. I'm a regular human, just uh, nine to fiver. Okay. What did you eat at the Denny's, Dan Housen? Pancakes. Pancakes or pancakes Housen? Pancake Housens. What's the, why, why do you add Housen to everything? Oh, that's my last name. Well, I, okay. <laughs> I like how you just switch back. And you, well, to be honest, that's my last name. That's just my last name. I just okay. add it. That makes sense. Make it, everything my last name. Make it about me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, so... We've been talking here for about, uh, geez, going on two hours now, just eating food, and uh, I haven't seen you in a while. And the one thing that I keep hammering home in messages to you when we talked about setting this up and everything, and the thing that I mentioned uh, as we're sitting here is like, when I first started interacting with you a couple years ago at Black Label Pro, I was doing commentary. Yes. We were getting booked to wrestle on the shows just as a singles guy, and... I think you came up to me and said, "What's your character?" Yes, because like, yeah. like, like, I wanted to treat it very professional because, like, I, I don't often do commentary, but I'd done some stuff at AAW. Mikey from Black Label booked me for commentary, and I, I just know that, like, I need information. You know what I mean? Like, I yes. want to know, like, what maybe there's a story to this match, and like, if I don't know who you are, like, what story am I going to tell? Like, you're gonna like, you're kind of, 
uh, creating the music and I'm making yeah. the lyrics to the music, right? So I wanted to know what your character is. And we were trying to figure that out. And we couldn't. Yes. And I remember you told me like you're just like a, you go to like underground punk shows yep. and yeah, stuff, yeah, yeah. right? Like, Which so, doesn't translate too well, but I think a lot of new guys kind of do that now yeah but like then but but then all the new guys are the same it's yes. kind of like uh you know like how do you want to look as a wrestler and it's like well i'll have long hair and, and a beard yeah <laughs> well, that's what i was i was tattooed beard guy and yeah, there's yeah. a million of those which which is interesting because like i was looking at old photos of you from like a few years back when yeah. you had the beard i look like edge you, you kind of do yeah, and yeah. like actually like i i barely like recognize you i felt no. like like is this another most people now when they see me come into a locker room they don't they don't recognize me at first, yeah. and then I put on the makeup, and they go, "Oh, hi, Dan Housen." Yeah, did, did, did we did we meet before Black Label? Because yes, now that, like, I think so. Because like now I feel like an idiot because like once I saw the pictures with you of a beard, and I saw like, might have been brief, like Dreamwave, maybe. Oh, probably Dreamwave. Yeah, maybe uh, somewhere in Michigan, but you don't. You no, live in Michigan. Yeah, I live in Michigan. I don't really here. wrestle here. Yeah, which which I always I always put that as a testament to how good someone is doing. If like you live in a certain city or state. I wrestled for old wrestling here and I wrrestle for Chainsaw Pro and yeah. Sanctuary Fight Club. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. like but like I feel like the more often you're out of the town that you live in, the better off you are. It just yeah. shows like like how good your career is. I, I like to think so. Also I was told to travel, but then yeah. I got a lot of a lot of crap from people right off the bat for not having a home base. Yeah, well like and, and that usually uh, I, I don't want to speak for you, but I feel that comes with like the uh, forty milers club. You know, what I'm yes. saying like the, the local yokels who like they like in the beginning they're like really pushing for you to like brother brother like why don't you be successful and then you start to become successful and then they're always like all of a sudden they're like fuck Dan Housen. Yeah, you know, isn't that interesting how that works? It's terrible. Yeah, it's really bad. It makes all the new guys feel bad. Yeah, but so we were trying to figure out your character at Black Label and we didn't really have a sense of what that was, um, other than like I don't know. I think like we talked about. The underground punk rock stuff, yep. and then like you're you're trained by Jimmy Jacobs, and so yes. I was like, which doesn't work for tough like the tattooed tough guy, but it works for what I do now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah but so like so to bring us full circle and like what we're talking about right now, like I'm so incredibly happy that you found who you are, and all it took was to be myself, be yourself, but also like I feel like it's something that would make you laugh. Yes. You know what I mean? It entertains you, and usually Which, that's the case. If if it make if, if it makes you laugh, and it entertains you. I always entertains watch others. back my videos that I put out now, and if I laugh at them, they're good enough to put out. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. I wouldn't normally laugh at my own stuff. So if it's making me laugh, the character that I've created, it's worth putting out to me. Yeah, like and, and, I, so I watched the RJ City thing, and he's hilarious. You did coffee in, in the underwear. Yeah, yeah, yeah coffee RJ in the again. underwear. And he's hilarious, so I knew he would make me laugh. But there was points where I was laughing at myself, and I was like, oh, that's great. That's good. That's really good. I think that's a testament of just like, uh, I mean, you're laughing, other people are laughing, and you're getting over. Because I've noticed a trend on social media over the last, I think it started around Halloween. Because that's where we're going. Yes, it was either right before Halloween, or it was uh, right at the beginning of October, or right at the end of September I did it. Because of your language, where you add house into everything, all of a sudden I see on Twitter like, Christy house. They're all the houses. And, and, and so they're like, what do you attest to that phenomenon? Is, this, is it just your speak? Is it your promos that are catching on? Like, what uh, you- So I think it's a little bit of everything. I think it's just fun to add house into stuff for whatever <laughs> reason. It, yeah, just, yeah. it just fits. Yeah. Uh, which I got very lucky with. So also, I think I posted a tweet about this, but it's been a, a while since I posted it. I was told my last name was too complicated. <laughs> okay. So I was Donovan Danger when I debuted. Really? Yes. And very simple. So, oh yeah, yeah. There was too many syllables for Danhausen, but Dan danger Housen, three. You could have two syllables. Two but not syllables, three. not three. <laughs> uh, so I was not able to be myself. Um, but I'd already made a pair of trunks with with DD on it. That's why they said Donovan Danger. Now you're stuck, man. And then I came out to rock you like a hurricane. It was awful. <laughs> oh no! Whose idea was that? I got the Booker, I believe. God. It was yeah. Uh, but yeah, so. It was uh, that is being told I couldn't use my name, yeah. and now that's my main thing is my name. I've turned my name into a thing. It's your thing. Uh, that the makeup I was told not to do. Um, to be fair, Jimmy Jacobs told me to do all of this stuff. Yeah. Eventually, when I took a seminar with him, and he just said, "Go for it." He's like, "You look like you're having fun. Do it." Yeah, and Jimmy's one of the brightest minds. Yeah. In the business. I, so my whole thing was, well, if Jimmy Jacobs told me I could do that. I can do that because if someone says something like, well, Jimmy Jacobs said I could do it. And they'll yeah. be like, oh, okay. Yeah. Cause they'll do, they'll do that. Yeah. I, I've known Jimmy for a long time and a few years back, I'm not going to get into all the details of it, but like I basically, 
I, I got an email from some higher ups in a major organization uh, that basically McDonald's. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I was trying to get a job at uh, Dan Housen has D's. a contract at McDonald's. Oh yeah, <laughs> so I was top, I, top billionaire company. Get out of here. So I I, uh, I got this email and it was very. I'm not offended by much, but I feel like if this email it wasn't. I, I guess I should preface with. It wasn't sent directly to me. Someone had sent this email for me, suggested me to McDonald's, and Ronald <laughs> wrote back and he said uh, some stuff that maybe could have be uh, construed as offensive. Yeah, I really took it to heart because I love <clears throat> not wrestling but working at McDonald's. Yes, and so <laughs> I I talked to Jimmy Jacobs about it and I was talking to him about like I feel like I've always had a better wrestling mind than a wrestling body um, because of my disability and yeah. so I was like I was like what do you think do I think I should try like writing or producing or something and uh, Jimmy was basically like fuck that like you have a great story and like it's pretty much what he wrestler. said to me different but he's, he said he's you know, blunt you yes. know and he's right to the point and like he gave me the courage to keep going and, and exactly and, and, so you say you did a seminar with Jimmy but I you tr- you trained with him I, yeah yeah right? yeah but it, it was more like that was when I first started so this was more kind of in the transitional period of me just being a guy and me starting to do the makeup character. And he kind of pushed me to just be myself and be weird and do literally whatever I want to do. And that was the thing was I was traveling and wrestling and hurting myself and putting miles on my car, not making any money and not having a good time wrestling. And yeah. what's the worst? you wrestling and you're not having fun. Yeah. And you're not making money. Well, it's already like um, to someone who doesn't, like or love wrestling it already sounds like a crazy thing so yeah. like then if you get in the wrestling business and then you also hate it like, it's, it's, like terrible. it's like the worst thing ever. and so my mentality was well i kind of want to quit yeah. so i was like well if i'm gonna quit anyway i might as well try and do have a little last run where i just do whatever i feel like doing and see if it works and if it doesn't work i can still quit but at least i tried doing what i felt like i should be doing yeah rather than just being like well, everyone has to be serious wrestler yeah, uh, and try to be the best wrestler. Everyone has to be Brian Danielson. Like, you know what I mean? Like, we, no one should try to emulate any of that, like, unless you're really, 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 really good. Yeah, I, I always um, – I might have talked about this before on the podcast, but, you know, there's always that saying that you hear on, like, WWE documentaries and stuff, like, if you're not in this business to be the top guy, then get the fuck out. Like, yeah, what are you doing? yeah, yeah. And I, I've never really – I guess especially when I became a wrestler, like I always thought, like that's sort of ridiculous. Like obviously you want to be successful at wrestling, yes. and you want to like draw money and like be like yeah. be um, I guess someone that could, the, the company would want to invest in. But like not everybody can be like the heavyweight champion. No, like, I'm no. smart enough to know that like Gregory Iron like is like the type of character that like definitely stereotypical good guy because of my situation. Yeah. But like. I put myself in a situation where like I proven myself as a good bad guy. Yeah. And like also you can't pigeonhole me as like this handicapped wrestler, right? Like I'm able to be the opening match. Yes. I can be the middle of the card. And like on rare occasions, I think I can be that guy that we're, like I get put in the heavyweight title match. Yeah. And like maybe there's this feeling like maybe the I'd underdog. like him to win, but like yeah. he's not actually going to win, right? So it's like I feel like I've, I've, I've made myself you valuable. You create the drama. Yes. Like yeah. I'm valuable anywhere on the card. And like so so what do you think in terms of – obviously you agree with me on this. Like yes. You don't have to be the heavyweight champion. No, but I think I could be put into scenarios where that's a thing. Yeah. Easily. Like, I think I've created a character that can be fit into serious, scary, funny, uh, main event, whatever you need, like a scramble match, any type of scenario. Um, I think the Danhausen character can fit. Yeah. Because it can work in any sort of way you need it to. Because I can just switch it like, like that. So... When we originally talked to Black Label, you had no sense of who you are. You start doing stuff that you like, and you figure out what this character is. Yeah. What is the inspiration for so, the character? So uh, what I say is always, um, when I first started doing the character, it was more so just on the, like me being straight, uh, trying to be scary, a scary, serious character. And I found that that can only go so far. Sure. People liked it. The videos took a long time to make. They were really fun. But... Uh, then I decided from, like, I always say I was Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and then I am now Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. Okay. Which is a, essentially a dark comedy yes. horror movie. Underrated. Very underrated. Gets it's my favorite. Over. I talk about it too much. Yes. Whenever I do a podcast, I bring it up. Yeah. <laughs> um, Dennis Hopper, right? He was in that? Yeah, yeah. Dennis yeah. Hopper. Uh, yeah. Uh, Bill Mosley. Yes. Uh, yeah. No, I always say that 
that's kind of the transition. The best way to explain it is Texas Chainsaw is a very scary, serious movie. Mm-hmm. Texas Chainsaw 2 is a very serious, like, very scary, dark comedy <laughs> horror movie that's gross and funny yes. and s- creepy. And it's just weird, which I think is more what I do. And I think that's more relatable. Sure. Because people are gross and weird and funny and creepy. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when you're in the wrestling business. You come across more gross and creepy yeah. than usual. You know? But I think everybody has those things. So everybody can relate to something with it. it it's good that you embrace your weirdness and like turn it into this character. Because I feel like to just just to be drawn to wrestling, there has to be something messed up about you. Like yes. in general, also, like, a screw loose. I think it helps when you're not taking yourself too seriously. Absolutely. I mean, it's pro wrestling. Like, I always say it's like you create logic out of the illogical, right? Because if you really yes. want to overanalyze pro wrestling, when we get whipped in the ropes Doesn't and make sense. back, it's ridiculous, yeah. right? But we have this wrestling logic where we I have think Joey to, Ryan always says that. Yes, we have to make it make sense. He's like, sense. oh, it's impossible for me to have a powerful dick, but <laughs> yeah. I can throw a man into some ropes and yes. he'll run back at me the to magic, get hit. The magic of pro wrestling is like for a few minutes having people believe in what we're doing, right? That's yes. the only magic we have it's left just, in entertain yes yes and you found that with your character but we're talking about how weird you are yes. and how to be a weird guy and fall in love with wrestling like you know it's 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 a weird thing where does that love for pro wrestling start for you what's your first memory mm, kane kane yep kane <laughs> easily kane and, i guess that makes sense uh, scary guy yeah that's why i do the choke slam yeah <laughs> um, yes uh no, 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 Kane uh, ripping off the door, I think, was a highlight that I saw. Okay. And Mick Foley and Chainsaw Charlie getting pushed off of the stage in a dumpster. Oh, yeah, with the New Age Outlaws. Because they played it 900 times, so yes. I will always remember it. Yes. And I remember hating that episode because that was the only <laughs> thing on the episode that I remember. <laughs> yeah. uh, so that, yeah. that's how you fell into it, like during the Attitude Era? You didn't yeah, watch yeah, yeah. And then uh, one Christmas, my dad just, uh, we had been watching it here and there, and I enjoyed it. And... I was opening my presents, and I think I opened a Bret Hart, and I was like, "Oh, what's this? This is just wrestling toys." What? What? I didn't know they existed. I so was, your dad was a fan? Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. He was just kind of like I think it was more so just a bonding thing with me. Uh, but I remember opening specifically weird uh, Daredevil toy. Okay. And then opening the next thing, and it was a Bret Hart, and I was like, "Oh, what?" And I think Undertaker and maybe Gold Dust, and then like a few others. I think Shawn Michaels, and then he got me the ring. Which was way too big for those toys. I don't know. It yes. was for them specifically, but it was way too big. It was. It was the like. Was it the first? It was made of hard Jax plastic. Guy? I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The first Jax ones. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So. And mankind was one of them I had. Yes. Yes. So how um, you and your dad start bonding about on, on wrestling? Yep. But, so, let's go back a little bit further. You, were you born in Detroit technically? Uh yeah, right around the area. Okay, so you're born in Detroit before wrestling comes in your life. Uh, what type of things were you interested in? What were you drawn uh, to? G.I. Joe's, Batman, Spider Man, uh, Ninja Turtles. I would usually, well, actually, that comes later, wrestling stuffed animals. But yes. I had a life size at the time of like same size Batman as me. Okay. And the same size uh, Ninja Turtle. So I would wrestle those because they're the same size. And reindeer. It was weird. I had little reindeer <laughs> that I wrestled. I had two of them. What, what, what kind of reindeer? They were like stuffed animal reindeers that were right. almost my size. All right. So I could hook them for suplexes and. That makes sense. Power bomb them. Who's your favorite turtle? Oh, uh, Raphael. Same. Yeah. Why? Why are you drawn to Raphael? He's a I dick. Feel, I, yes. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I'm I'm angsty. You know, yeah, I yeah. can be very it's angry at him times. And, actually, as a kid, I think it was Donatello because I really like the color purple. Okay. Fair. He's smart too. Smart yeah. guy. He does yeah. machines. Which yes, true. <laughs> <laughs> what about? Uh, what, you, Batman. What's your favorite version of Batman? Was this Batman plush? Was it like animated series? No, like it was like a version? weird uh, comic book version because he was blue. I remember that. Okay. He was blue. He was blue, gray suit, uh, yellow symbol. So what's your favorite version of Batman? Oh, animated series. Okay. Easily. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Classic. Yeah. It's got the best version of every character. For sure. So, yeah. So that also probably had some influence on my character now, too. Yeah. Just... Mark Hamill specifically, yeah, 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 not even Joker, just Mark Hamill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mark Hamill's voices. Uh, he did Hobgoblin. He's done a bunch of various like Incredible Hulk characters. Sure. He's a trickster. Just him in general. I think more so. People will say the Joker. And like I don't know, Mark Hamill. Yeah, yeah. Now you talked a little bit about uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yes. We were talking before we started recording about your love for horror films. Like when does that come into play? Oh, I think way too young. Yeah? Yeah, probably before wrestling. Okay. Yeah, I would say uh, 
what is it? I remember watching, I think it was Bad Taste, which I think is a, who directed Lord of the Rings? Peter, not, the not, I, not I, Dinklage, but the other guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's on the tip of my tongue. I, I'm it actually was one not of a his, fan of the Lord of the Rings. No, me either. Yeah. I can't watch them. They're, I hate them. I'm yeah, not a fan. I fall asleep. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, um, I forget his name, but he, it was one of his first movies, and it's just a gory horror movie. Uh, that, Dead Alive. Um, okay. Movies I shouldn't have been watching, probably. But, sure. like, Friday the 13th and uh, all the classics. Classic. I remember just seeing bits and pieces of. Yeah. So, and then just as I got older, it just developed into me actually liking movies like American Werewolf in London and Alien. And I remember Predator was a big thing for me as a kid. So that's transitioned over to, I've used that as clips and music before I switched over the character and everything. I had Predator trunks, Predator shirt. All that stuff. That's awesome. I, I find a lot of your promo videos are edited in a very strange, almost like B movie. Type. Yeah, it's kind of like the um, the beginning of Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It's yes. got the film reel and it looks grainy and crappy. Uh, it's a very B movie ish, like uh, like B movie starring uh, Jerry Seinfeld. Yes, yes. <laughs> no, no, uh, no, no, like e- Evil Dead, Evil yeah. Dead Two. Those were my favorites growing up. Army of Darkness was one of yes. them. Did, which, did you watch Ash versus Evil Dead? Because I just I did. started watching it. Uh, and I liked I it. it. Yeah, yeah. I don't know why it took me so long to start watching. No, no, no it's fun. It's if great. Bruce Campbell's in it, it's fun. Yeah, yeah for sure. Uh, Army of Darkness is another good example of my character. Is Evil Dead to Army of Darkness? Okay. So because it's a, it's a crazy transition when you yes, think about it. it d- but it works. Yeah. I don't know why, but I love it. Sometimes you can't fight why certain well, things like, are getting over, right? You can't. At least me. I can't just put on Texas Chainsaw Massacre on whatever day and just want to watch it. I can throw on Texas Chainsaw 2 because yeah. it's fun. I can throw on American Werewolf in London because it's fun. It's got a comedy aspect to it. It's got like a sarcastic tone. Uh, same with Evil Dead 2 and Army of Darkness. Yes. Like I can just throw those on. So these are all heavily influences in your character when you eventually become a wrestler. You see Kane, you get some action figures from your dad. Um, at what point do you think to yourself, well, maybe this is something I want to be a part of? Well, I was working at a movie theater with my friend Woody, and I thought he looked like Cody Rhodes. Woody is a great name for Yeah, it is. Thing. That's it his is. real name? Yes. Yeah. Okay, Woody. I love that. Yeah. Uh, so he, this kid had started working at my the movie theater I'd been working at for a few years, and I was like... I told my other two best friends who work there, uh, Nick and David, I was like, this guy looks like Cody Rhodes a little bit. What do you think? And they're like, yeah, he does. <laughs> and he comes up to me one day and he goes, so I hear you think I look like Cody Rhodes. Oh, no. And I went, oh, no. And he, I was like, wait, do you know who that is? And he goes, yeah, dude. He's like, I love wrestling. And he's like, I'm actually looking into going to a school that's local called the House of Truth. And so I was like, wait, what? Like, I had no idea that it was a school like two miles away from my house. And he... Actually, uh, I didn't have enough money at the time, and he fronted me all of the money, barely knowing me because he knew how much I loved wrestling. Oh wow! And was, he was House just, of Truth like fifteen hundred bucks? It was something like that. Yeah, he. That's crazy. It might have been cheaper at the time. It might have been a thousand. Okay. But still, to give a thousand dollars to somebody—that's nuts. Yeah. No, no, no. He was great. Uh, he's still one of my great friends. I wish I could see him more. But I I'm wish always... you, you. I wish you would have said, and then I never talked to him. Again. No, and then I never talked to him again. <laughs> no, no. He had gone and trained with me, but uh, he had some health issues. When he started training, wasn't able to continue. So he still checks up constantly on me and see how, like, just talks to me about what I'm doing, how happy he is. Uh, I still get to see him every once in a while, but he knows I'm on the road a lot now. So that's awesome. So you start training at the House of Truth. So are you technically under Truth, or is this where you get that tutelage from Jimmy Jacobs, or do you learn for a little, a little bit, bit of both? both? Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What's um, that look like? Ah, uh, it's hard. I think I don't think people realize how hard wrestling school is. It's, it sucks. What's the process look like? Like, run me through a typical day with Truth, because a lot of wrestling schools are different. Like, for me, it was um, when I started with JT Lightning before the tr- transition over to Johnny, me and Johnny just fucked around, because, like, half the time it would just be me and Johnny. And yeah. Trent. But with JT, it, would, it was constantly bumping, and then, like, looking back on it, really stupid. Like, we just, he's like, all right, dudes, line up, powerbomb drill. And yeah. And they'd be like, what? And they'd be like, all right, dude, suplex drill. Like, we it's took horrible. a few of those towards the end of the class after we'd already learned everything. Just like, hey, you're going to learn how to take a power driver. Hey, you're going to learn how to take a power bomb. Hey, this, this, this. But it was never like a drill of like five of these, five of these, five of these. Um, no, it'd just be like, we learned how to bump, obviously. I think the first day we talked for about an hour. Um, there's a lot of psychology stuff, a lot of uh, truth 
telling us how to work without bumping because he had to do that for so long with a broken neck. Yes, I remember that. Uh, which is great now because I try to do that all the time. Yeah. <laughs> S- save your bump card, brother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, it was just a lot of that and just uh, footwork and trying not to trip over each other and hurt the other guy. Sure. Yeah, I mean, the main thing which, is, like, you want to protect your opponent. Yes. Right? And now I feel like, at, I don't know if schools do this now, but I, I always think they should do a social media course. They really should. Because I, it's not, it's, I think it's right behind protecting yourself and your opponent now. For sure. As being important, like, in wrestling as a business for yourself. Yeah, well, because, you know, when I was coming up, in, you started 2012? Right around there. I think it was 2012 or 2013. It's, like, in between somewhere. Okay, so social media is very prevalent at that point. When I started in 2006, we're still on the cusp of, like, like MySpace, probably. Yes, yes, yeah. we're on MySpace, and we're realizing um, this is a good way to like market ourselves because a few years before that, really all you have is like AIM yep. and email, and before that, you just call places, send tape, and hope for the best, right? I hope so it like, makes it to them. So yeah, so in the two thousands, we have like this thing where like, you know, the internet and social media, where it's like you kind of have no excuse. No, to not research I see guys who don't, don't have social media. They don't have Twitter. Horrible. And they're just using Facebook. And I'm like, what are you doing? It's free marketing for Like, yourself. Facebook is the worst one. Yeah, for sure. The, to be fair, be a lot of people do message me on Facebook for bookings, so that's not fair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, like... We love bookings on Facebook, everyone. Yes, but <laughs> Twitter is where all the fans are. Yes. And I you, find Instagram, there's a lot Instagram of Instagram is too. good. I just, like, for me personally, I've noticed Twitter is the one that, like, you can post pretty much whatever you want. Like, if you want to throw music on something, you can do it. And yeah. F- there's more freedom on there. Yeah. I think social media is very important. I, I, I've been doing more seminars um, over the past couple of years, and I always try to bring up social media because I feel like even when I wasn't wrestling in like the biggest promotions, I was wrestling in relevant places, but I think what kept me relevant was my constant engagement on social media, like yes. always posting stupid pictures. Like I feel like for me, my strength isn't like um, – 140 characters on Twitter. My strength is like, here's a picture and here's yeah, a dumb yeah. caption. Here's a video. Here's a dumb caption. Exactly. And like it added layers to who I was. Like I'm not just like this no, stereotypical create, candy. Create guy. content. Yes. Yes. Because like, that's where the teeth came from. Yes. Well, no. So that started with technically Bobby Beverly. Yep. My I correct? Yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> How'd you find that out? I do my research. Okay. Now. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so like, uh, and I want to delve into Bobby Beverly here in a second, but cause actually, all right. So, We'll tell your story first. So, so you, you all they did, Bobby Beverly. yes, all they did, I worked with them. We brawled around the ring. I hit him with a Brock Lesnar toy, I think, because okay. uh, someone was selling it, of course. Yep. Um, I put him in a surfboard and pulled his face up, and that was one of the photos that got, got snapped. Okay. I, f- I don't know. Like a week later, I just needed something to post, just for content. Post something that I had done, and I put, I think I want to eat his teeth, and then literally from a tweet that was just meant to be content grew into the teeth. Now, was the idea being that, was he wearing his fake tooth? Or no, 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 no. He just, he I was just pulling, missing his tooth. No, not even that. I was okay. just pulling his face up, like Daniel Bryan style. Okay, so this is just very coincidental because... Very coincidental, you, yes. So do you know that Bobby Beverly lost his tooth in a wrestling match? No, I had no idea. So okay. now I feel bad for even... <laughs> and, because I, that's what I thought the backstory was. No, no, was, no, no. Because I didn't see the segment. I, I, I did some research and yeah. I found out I was, you were working with Bobby. I was actually in the match where Bobby lost his tooth. No, so I didn't have no idea. So me and Johnny trained Bobby Beverly, and we had a match at this event, Pro Wrestling Ohio Resolution 2, where I was randomly managed by Oscar from Men on a Mission, Okay, which is a whole story in itself. That, <laughs> that fucking guy is a piece of work. So he wrapped us to the ring, and so on one side it was like me, Marion Fontaine, I love him. And this guy, he's great. And uh, this guy, Naj the Wild Samoan, which okay. deserves a podcast all to himself. He, he was Naj the Wild Samoan, and he wanted to be billed from Tonga. Okay, good. That doesn't make sense. <laughs> no, right? okay. that's fine. So um, anyways, so on the other side was Sex Appeal, which was Bobby Shields, Nikki Valentino, and Bobby Beverly. And we had the spot where all he was supposed to do was miss, um, miss a stinger splash on the corner on me. Ooh. I rolled out of the way. He jumped too high, and he did the and he Billy Gunn. He he, yes, he, 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 he did the Billy Gunn spot, you know, where he tries yeah. to like, take the post, but he hit his mouth on on uh-huh. the post, and like when he turned around, um, I remember seeing just blood drenched on his chest, and I'm like, what the heck just happened? And after the match, the like, easiest, his tooth was gone, and like he finished the match or whatever, but like 
afterwards, like you'll have to look next time, um, in honor of that match, he got a, a broken tooth tattooed on his oh, arm. Oh, no, I didn't know. Bobby, See, I had no idea. Yeah, Bobby has some of the worst tattoos ever. As another sidebar, <laughs> um, he has XXS, XXX tattooed on his arm. And when he got it, me and Johnny asked, hey, man, why did you get this tattooed? He goes, because I'm straight edge. And I'm like, you haven't been straight edge. Like, you yeah. were drinking and smoking yeah, a yeah. while back. And you're like, well, I am now, but, you know, if I go back to drinking and smoking, I guess it's just going to mean I like porn. You know, and he just says it with a straight <laughs> face. Like, like, have you had interactions with Bobby yes. besides wrestling? Yes, I have. He is something. He's, yeah, he's great. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's a guy for sure. Very talented. Yes. And I'm glad he's back out there, like, doing it because he had so much potential, and then he took some time off and had some kids, and now yeah. he's back. And uh, he just, he's, he's really very fun. It. Yeah, he's awesome. So you do this peewee dance, <laughs> and people don't seem to know where the peewee dance is from. No. What is that about? That is, I was booked for Unsanctioned Pro in Columbus against PB Smooth, who is a very jacked six foot five man. I think he's six foot five. He might be taller now. No, call him six reamed. foot five because he wants you to say that he's a seven foot savage. But he's not seven feet tall. Every time I see him, I go. Kane is seven sh- feet tall. He's not tall, as tall as Kane. He, no way. I, I go. Have you shrunk, man? He's like, shut up. It gets real bad. So, but my whole thing was. What am I going to do in this match? The barroom brawl. There's no ring. And I walked in, and I immediately looked at the bar. I looked at the promoter, and I said, hey, Derek, uh, can I use that bar? And he's like, yeah, what do you have in mind? I was like, I'm going to peewee dance on it and kick PB in the face. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, sure. Do you think that'll work? And I was like, we'll see. Why not? And now I do it every single show because people like it. People love it. <laughs> it's just shoehorn it in there. Yep. It's just in. Uh, I do it at the beginning of the match usually. It gets a crowd very into me. Uh, I think a lot of times people think if they don't know who I am and they see me at the merch table, they go, oh, another makeup wrestler. Great. Yeah, yeah. Well, you got to win them over. And then I got to win them over, and I try to do that immediately through the curtain. Sure. I just show them, oh, no, he's not scary. Yeah. Like, he is, but he is not. He's something different. Right, right, right. And they gotta, they're trying to put and their finger on like, it. And they're like, wait, what is happening? But even if they don't realize like what the character is or what you're trying to do, they're now they're they're hooked. You've yes. hooked them. And again, we're gonna keep going back to this. Like it's so awesome that like you've like found something that clicks on all cylinders. But when you started, so you go through your training. How long did you train before you actually started? Uh, what is it? Twelve weeks, I think. And okay. then I did a little bit extra too. Okay. So then were you training at all after that or you just boom? Uh, periodically. Okay. And then I was just trying to go out on the road. Okay. So where was your first show? It was Metro Pro Wrestling, I believe. Okay. In, what is it? Taylor, Michigan? Okay. I believe that was it. Okay. And you're Donovan Danger. Yes. At Rock some you point. like a hurricane. <laughs> okay. Rock you like a hurricane. So as you progress. Beat up in a handicap match. Is that what it was? A handicap yes. match? Yeah. How terrible was it? I don't think it was too terrible. You say that, but when's the last time you watched I it? I have never watched it. I'm sure. But it's no awful. one said it was that terrible. I also wrestled Austin Mannix in my second match and okay. he said it was he said it was fine. Okay. And he All still right. says it was fine. Fair. So I believe him. Fair. Because I think he would be very honest. Okay. So at what point do you realize, eh, I don't want to be Donovan Danger, I'm gonna do something. Oh, else. first day. Donovan well, Danger. Well, okay, but oh, like but, when you oh, realize okay. like I'm actually gonna change this. Oh yeah, yeah. So that was like you said, I was driving, traveling around and wanting to quit wrestling. So that was the transition from that was quit or do what I want. But you don't become this Dan Housen oh, character no, 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 right no. away because you, you have this period of time where you're, you're, you're experimenting with things. You, you're kid gorgeous for a while. Oh, bit. yeah, yeah. Well, that was a Simpsons reference, which oh. you would, yeah. I would get, yeah, so you got that. that. That's, so that's a little sidebar, too. That's how we initially bond. When yes. I met you at Black Label Pro that day and we're talking, before I'm even, like, uh, asking you anything about commentary, you had a Simpsons uh, briefcase. Oh, yeah, yeah, where I kept my gear. And I saw it and I was like, First of all, that's not new. I saw, yes. I like, I yeah. saw it. I just knew the way it looked. I'm like, no, that's no, very vintage because I'm very into vintage shirts. Yeah, and it has shit. It had like some someone's name inside of it, <laughs> yeah, which made it yeah. even better. And as soon as I saw it, I was like, yo, where did you get that? And then yep. we started talking Simpsons. Yeah. Like, tell me about your love for Simpsons and how much of an impact besides oh, Kid Gorgeous does oh, it have on your character now? Oh, so much. Uh, Mr. Burns, the leader, which most people get now that the leader is. I have it as my header. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, no. Definitely uh, Mr. Burns, for sure. My, my signature pose that I take with everybody is Mr. Burns' hands. Yes. Uh, it's, that, it. it's either that or it's Zorak from okay. Space Ghost. Yep. Um, but yeah, no, uh, I nonstop between wrestling and Simpsons is what I would watch. How do you feel about current Simpsons? Because there's I don't some, watch it. You don't watch last it? Last time I was in New York City, um, well, not the last time, but one of the times I was in New York City, I looked at a... Uh, it was at a, I think we were eating at a bar, 
and I looked at the TV, and it wasn't a Treehouse of Horror episode, but they flew to space. Okay. And I was like, nope, nope Anytime never again. anything goes to space, it's bad. I don't think that was even the point of the episode, but I think it was, like, real. They were going to space for some reason, and oh, it wasn't boy. Deep Space Homer. It wasn't set up. It was right at the beginning. I th- so, I've watched more recent episodes of The Simpsons, and for years, you know, like, after, they like, They just seem season- like they don't have heart anymore. I agree. I agree. Um... And I love, like, up to, like, season 10 or whatever. Yes, And then I feel like, like most, like, they just kind of fall out of it. But it's one of those things where it's, like, if you look at these newer episodes without... They're family guy, kind of, but, like, kind PG of. family guy. It's yeah, weird. Yeah, yeah, Like, and I, I still sort of laugh at them because Homer's ridiculous. Yeah. But, like, it's not the same. But I don't hate them like everyone yeah. else does. In fact, did you see the Simpsons movie? Yes. I remember when that came out in 2007. I was like, why is this happening in 2007? It should have been it, uh, Who Shot Mr. Burns. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, or, or they, and like in general, they should have just had a movie back in the early 90s, right? Yeah. And so it just seemed too late. But I actually went back and it wasn't until like five years ago that I actually saw it. And I really loved the Simpson movie. I thought it was really I good. I have to rewatch it. I've only watched it, I think, once. So you, it sounds like you weren't a fan of it. I just think I didn't care. I think okay. it was fine. That makes sense. It was like an okay episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because Hour it, and a half episode. It seems like it's a lesser version of Who Shot Mr. Burns. For sure. So I think that's where I'm at with that. What's your favorite Simpsons episode? Ooh, that's always tough. Uh, I love the Joy of Sect, which is okay. where I got the leader from. Yep. Um, who Shot Mr. Burns is great. Classic. Uh, Radioactive Man. Mm-hmm. Uh, what else is there? Ooh, uh, what is it? Um, Bart on the Road, where they steal the car. Yes. <laughs> that one's really good. Classic. Uh, Bart of Darkness. Uh-huh. There's, what is it? Season, I can't remember. It's disc one of season eight. Eight, I believe. Okay. Either seven or eight has the best. It's the best disc. It has Hugo as the Treehouse of Horror episode. Okay. Um, it has Hurricane Nettie. It has Burn Baby Burns. Yes. Uh, Bart of Darkness. Uh-huh. I think Hank Scorpio. What's that episode? I don't know offhand, but I know but what you're talking it's, about. It's got. I think this is. I think that's the order of the disc. I gotcha. And it's the best. I feel like an underrated episode that I always reference is. Where they had George Bush. Oh, that one's great. The street. George Bush my, and it, Jet Bush Jr. <laughs> yeah, that's one of yeah. my favorite parts. Or the opening that's really underrated where they're having their yard sale. And, uh, he's that's got Disco the, Stu's debut. Yes, that's his debut because they, he's like, I tried to put Disco Stud on the yep. back of the vest and I ran out of room. And then they go, hey, Stu, that's jacket for you. And, and <laughs> yes. he's got the dead, the dead fishes in his that shoes. That one is and great. Just so good. I love The Simpsons. In fact, like it's become like, it's funny how you talk about how, like, you just want to do stuff that entertains you. Yes. I love The Simpsons. Oh, that was another thing. I used to get yelled at for doing too many Simpsons references. Who cares? My whole character is a Simpsons reference Yeah, now. who cares? Like, like, love that Dan Housen. I feel like somehow that was influenced by The that Simpsons. That is 89 Batman. Okay. That makes sense. Yes. Love that Joker. Gotcha. He sells products. Yes. Okay. Dan Housen sells products. All right. Because in my mind, like, I kept, I kept trying to make the connection. Like, I knew what the connection was, but... I know your love of The Simpsons. I was like, yeah. I feel like that's no, a Simpsons I love, thing. No, I love 89 Joker, 89, Batman. 89 Batman is I love great. Michael Keaton. Michael Keaton. I'll watch anything with Michael yes. Keaton. Yes. Multiplicity is and, one of my favorites. God damn it. It's so <laughs> good. It's so good. Um, I, I, I love The Simpsons. I love 89 Batman. I love The Simpsons so much. What I was trying to get to was, you know, you talk about doing stuff that just makes you happy and entertains you. And, like, you know, you hope that, like, if it's entertaining you – the audience will pick up yes. on it, which is I just usually have the case. fun. Yeah, and so usually it, they'll have fun if I'm having fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I, I, so for me, like, I got tired of doing like just generic gear with like handicap symbols on it. Yeah. So like, I ended up uh, just putting dumb shit that like makes me laugh on my yeah. ear. So Why it's not? Like, so now a consistent thing on my hip is I really like bootleg Bart shirts. Oh, yeah, from, yeah. from the early yes. '90s because they're ridiculous. And a buddy of mine, OK Pants, he he designs a lot of stuff, and um, he was in some local bands in Cleveland. He designed this. Uh, bootleg Bart shirt with Bart's face kind of in the shape of Ohio. Okay. Obviously, I'm from yeah. Ohio, so now I always put that on my hip because, See? like, it's a Simpsons love it. reference. I, I love Ohio. And then, like, you know, I got this one pair of gear where, like, I have a Ninja Turtle on my crotch, Raphael, of course, but, like, he looks like a, a garbage pail kid because I love garbage pail kids, <laughs> and he's sitting on a toilet for no reason. Yeah. He's eating pizza. Who I, cares? All that stuff makes me laugh, but, like, visually, it looks cool. Yeah. People are, like, looking at my crotch now, not just because <laughs> I'm Papa Schlongo yeah. in some places, yeah. but because, you know, I have interesting stuff in my tights. Yes. Like if it entertains me, it's going to entertain others. And obviously, that's what you figured out. So you do the kid gorgeous thing for a while. What's the inspiration? Like, obviously, it's, it's the it's, Simpsons. Yeah, like, it so was, what's, it what's was literally character? just uh, arrogant new guy. Yeah. Which I think is a lot of guys. Uh, sure. There's a lot of guys who are better at it than I was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, like, uh, I wrestled Johnny. And that was my character with him was I actually uh, Mustafa Ali got hurt. Okay. 
and he was going to wrestle Johnny at Dreamwave's anniversary show, which is like their WrestleMania show. And they're like, "Hey, we're going to have you wrestle Johnny Gargano." This is like my fifth match. Oh, and I was like, shit, really? I was like, "Yes," and I was one ter- on one. Yes, okay. and I was terrified because he was like the first like name I was wrestling. Yeah, and it was only like five or six matches in, I think. Okay, and he was great. But my character was, hey, I'm going to come out. Who's this guy? I'm going to palm face him. And then I spit gum in his face. <laughs> okay. And then we had a competitive match. He, it, was, it was cool. And then the following month, we had our, like, second match. And he, how much, uh, I don't know, whatever, wrestling's wrestling. Uh, the first match, he basically kind of took control of it. Second match, he actually trusted me because he knew, he knew I could listen and sure. everything at the time. And he said, what do you want to do this time? And he let me put it together. It's really cool, and I was I was like, great, yeah. And I'm sure, like, it, like, because I've done this myself with Johnny, where I had like dog shit ideas when I was younger, and like, it's funny when I say like when I was younger, because like, he technically only wrestled a year younger, a year longer than me, but like, he was so much more advanced even back then. I'm sure he took your ideas and then molded them yes. into something better. Yeah, and then yeah. He, I didn't call the entire match, but yeah, he yeah, definitely yeah. was like, uh, let's hear your ideas for this match. I want to hear what you have. Yeah, and then I will put my input on it. Yeah, and it was. It was it was great. It was great as a new kid to give me confidence. Yeah. What? Um, let's fast forward a little bit. As far as wrestling psychology, uh, do you find as you get more advanced as a wrestler and you start to understand things, do you find when you're calling a match with someone else and they have like, there's like a nugget of a good idea, but yes. in general the idea is bad. How do you approach that? Because for me, it's usually like I like that, and then as I go walk off, I think to myself. How do I turn down this idea and but take a piece it, of that and turn it into something like, hey, well, so why don't we try it like this? So it sounds like they're this? getting their idea still. Yes, yes. Because they should get their idea because that's yes. their stuff. Yeah, and, and if, if there's good stuff in it, why not use it? I just, think that's a good learning thing, though. Yes. Is just suggesting rather than telling. Sure. Is just, hey, let's try it like this because it makes more sense. And I think if I do it this way, it's going to look really silly. How do you try to build matches now in terms of like where your character is? Like, like, do you find so, like, like, you do you try to, do you try to mold the, because I feel like the Dan Housen character can blend in with anyone. Yeah, and I feel like you probably plan your matches in a way where you you very much. Um, I don't want to say compensate. What's the word I'm looking for here? Um, you, what is it? I melt my, into them. Yeah, that works. Yeah, that's yeah, not the word. That's not it. But yeah, Converge yeah. into them. Yes, yes. You, you, you come together to make this one cohesive unit yes. you know, where you, you make that person look better and, and work with look, your character Look, because I well. can – I'll do my silly stuff. Yeah. But I can have the serious guy be serious towards it, and it plays off really well. Yes. Because just beat me up. That's my match now is beat me up. Yes. <laughs> and then – I will do my cool things. I will do my weird things, but you can beat me up throughout it and be serious. Yes. So now we're going to go back in time again. So Kid Gorgeous. Yes. Eh, not feeling right about that. No, it was okay. It was Got okay. me so far. Yeah. Um, but you were getting around for a little bit. Like yeah. you, you were doing the Dreamwave yeah. a lot, which you, you, at one point you moved to Florida. Yes. Are you doing Dreamwave while you're in Florida? No, no, no. I got beat up by all of NXT, I believe. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> no, I feel no, no, because uh, <laughs> Davari beat me up there. Um, okay. Mustafa Ali beat me up there. Johnny beat me up there. Uh, I don't think Tommaso beat me up there, but he was there a lot, so maybe he did. Okay, in a bu- battle royal or something. But I just always make the joke that if you kicked my ass in Dreamwave, yeah, you're on NXT or Two Hundred Five Live right now. <laughs> that makes sense. Uh, but yeah, no, no. I my last match there was with Davari. Okay. And then they beat me up out of the group, and I packed away and went and lived in Florida for two years and didn't really wrestle too much. Okay. So you were getting around for a little bit, and you were doing the dream wave. You did some shots for Inspire for a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. I loved Inspire. Inspire's great. So what makes you go, I'm going to go to Florida and just not wrestle? Like, were you just well, kind of sick no, of it? No, no, no. I thought there would be more wrestling in Florida. Oh. I thought it was going to be a hot spot. What gave you that idea? <laughs> because I, because NXT was there, and I uh, thought okay. there would be a lot of stuff around it trying sure. to, for guys trying to get signed. And yeah. like, I was like, oh, it's probably like booming with wrestling, and it is a wasteland. Yeah, there's nothing. No, there is uh, Ronin Pro Wrestling I liked. Okay. Uh, that was in Miami area, and they had uh, Trevor Reed was running it, and he's great. Uh, and then I met Effie there, so I actually yes. don't regret it. But there is a picture floating around of me looking like I am having the worst time wrestling Effie. He's bent over in front of me, and I look like I'm going to cry. <laughs> I remember the spot, and I just hit him after it. But okay. uh, it is the worst because no one should be sad wrestling Effie. Sure. 
He's but tremendous. I was. It was awful. Not him. Just no, my situation. Your situation. And then I was like, I have to leave. And I stayed in touch with Effie because Effie was the like one of the only things that I like loved about Florida was seeing Effie every so often. Was because at Fest Wrestling, for whatever reason, they always stuck us together. Like we always were in some sort of multi man together or a tag match against each other. So I've always had that connection with him, which is cool because it's between him and Warhorse. We both came up kind of all together in the same timeline. Sure. But in different areas. Because I would go to St. Louis Anarchy a lot too. Okay. And the little Viking, Jake Parnell, was there. Yes. I you know, I've known I've known him for years. Yeah. I didn't realize Gowan just told me today because I was talking about yeah I'm gonna talk to Dan Housen tonight and uh, you know him and Warhorse are like just like they got so much buzz and they're killing it and he's like yeah remember when we wrestled uh, Jake at, at uh, the gathering of Juggalos and I was like no yeah he's probably with the Vikings he was I totally forgot yeah, about that that was him like he just broke idiot. away from them and then he was just uh, Jake Parnell for the longest time yes and so then- weird. Now he's Warhorse. Yes, and it just, it's, like, it's getting over, man. Sometimes you just do things that make you Rid- laugh, ridiculous right? Ridiculous characters. So you're in Florida. You realize you hate it. The wrestling scene sucks. Yeah. What makes you move back home? Uh, because I l- the worst. I was depressed. Um, yeah, I was just I was working uh, and barely wrestling. And I was like, why am I down here? What were you doing for a real job? Uh, I worked at Starbucks. So I was waking up at 5 a.m. Ugh. For no reason. Ugh. To go to this job. My boss was very nice. Yeah. But, yeah, it was awful. Terrible. Uh, that was literally all I was, I was doing. I, was, I felt like I was wasting away. Um, I was just sitting on a couch. I was watching people play video games on YouTube. I don't even, I don't even care about that. <laughs> what kind of video games are you watching? Uh, well, I was watching, like, Resident Evil and stuff okay. like that. So they're actually, like, cinematically good Okay. Uh, and fun to watch, but... It's funny because I, I do myself watch a lot of like walkthroughs. I, like, like, so um, I realize I don't like video games anymore, but I do like watching walkthroughs. It's weird, right? Like I don't. I, I when can't I try play, to play them, I'm like, nah. I can't play modern games, but like anything that's like retro or like yeah. angry video game nerd or any yeah. of that stuff, like I'll go and watch it because I have like one of those retro pies that I get yeah, yeah. where it's just like, like every game ever. And uh, I still get engrossed in that stuff. So I, I still new. like them if like a game comes out that it, like the Resident Evil 2 re- remake. Yeah. Those are classic. I was going to play it, yeah. and then I was just like, well, I'll just watch it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's cheaper, and then I don't have to stress about not being able to beat it. <laughs> yeah, so. I can just watch somebody else smoothly go through it. Yeah, sure. You, they, they got all the answers, man. You don't got to yeah. waste your time. So you move back home. Now, when you move back home, not only is it because you hate it, do you think, like, I'm going to revitalize this wrestling career? Yes. So yeah. what does that approach look like? That approach looks like I'm going to hit everywhere I possibly can, as much as I possibly can. Like, I think that's when I started to do Black Label Pro. Yep. Uh, I did Alpha One, um, Rockstar, which is where I was going every week, and it was burning me out. But that that, that was probably good experience, That though, was good because, because it turned into Wednesday. this, because I got frustrated. And I got sick of doing the same thing every single week and not getting over. Yeah. And not having fun. So... Uh, from there, that was the frustration that created this, ultimately. And I was doing, like, I think Super Kicked and everything in uh, Toronto. But, yeah, that was me just trying to hit everywhere and developing into a, a huge frustration. And not depression, but almost. Yeah. So you say, fuck it, I'm going to do what I want. You come up with this character. You start painting your face. And around the same time... You kind of got your foot in the door with AIW. Kind well, of that was only because of uh, Jimmy Jacobs, I think. Okay. Was I did that seminar. I was not booked. Uh, so they saw me do that, I, th- I think. I don't know. I could be wrong. Um, and then that one fella, I don't know his name. I always feel bad. Well, I, he left the production. I don't know. He just stopped wrestling. I can't remember his name either, but like I... So there was a spot open. Yeah. And then I filled that spot because mm-hmm. it was a weirdo in the production, which is a theater group at yeah. the time. Yeah. Des- describe the production for someone that might not know. So. At that time. At that time, it was Frankie Flynn, Magnum CK, who is wonderful. Great. Uh, Derek Director or Direction. I think he goes by both sometimes. Yes, yes. He started uh, as Direction, but then when he got pitched for the production, it was like, oh, yeah, he's the Director. Director, director. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, Eddie Only. Yep. Um. So, yeah, it was like a theater group, kind of. Uh, obviously, Derek Director was the director. Uh, they had Frankie Flynn as the lead, which 
Magnum CK, I always thought of as our leader. Same. And, uh, and also, like... And no like, disrespect to Frankie. It was just... I Magnum CK was the most popular one, without a doubt, in that group. Well, here's the thing. And, so, like... And if, he is a theater guy. If, if I could be Frank, and you could still be Donovan. Okay. okay. Uh, <laughs> I... I always saw Frankie as like, obviously, I think the idea behind the production and making him the lead was he had this legitimate theater background. But it was so strange because for a guy who actually has a theater background, anytime I heard him do interviews or promos, it just didn't, it di- he was very shy, yeah. reserved, and it didn't strike me as a guy that went to school well, for theater. My whole thing was I came in out from the outside and I just immediately assumed Magnum CK was the leader. I think a lot of people would do because that when they see because he's just, also the biggest. I don't know. He's the biggest, like the presentation, the cape. Like, like it just made sense that he would be the lead. He was very vocal and yes. he cut great promos. Actually has like uh, drama and production background. And now he does it. Yes. Now that he's not wrestling, he yes. just does theater, but that's great. Yes. So that's that's what the original production and then, looks yeah, like. Yeah, and then Eddie only was the stage hand. Yes. Which he's developed into just a mean guy, which I like. Yes, well, like, so the, it had to evolve once yes. Magnum CK which, unfortunately had to retire. Or initially, when you were brought in, they wanted you to be the writer. Because yes. I remember that was still, like, I was still at AIW at that point. I remember we, I think we had, like, a brief conversation. It was like, you got because they, they had told me, like, well, he's the writer. So I'm like, oh, I, I remember saying, like, what are you going to do to, like, show, show you're that the, I'm writer, the writer? You know what I mean? And yeah. So it was, like, one of those things, like. And I kind of didn't know, but. It was only be able to shown in promos was yeah. me typing. Sure. So that's kind of how we got that across, but yep. you can't really bring a typewriter everywhere. <laughs> right. Uh, I mean, if I had a portable one, I guess I could have. But <laughs> uh, lug that around. No, and I just used the spike like Jimmy Jacobs, and yeah. I kind of was like, I'm writing on people when mm-hmm. I hit them in the head, sure. like sort of thing. So, uh, which also I always wanted to do writer versus writer match. Yes. With Jimmy Jacobs, that would have been great. But it never happened. I mean, it still could happen. It still could happen. Yeah, it could happen. Hey, someone out there, if you're listening to this. Dan Housen versus Jimmy Jacobs, writer versus writer. Loser must give away all of his pens. Yes, I don't computer. really have any, so that's fine. <laughs> <All right. laughs> so now the production has greatly changed. Frankie yes. Flynn no longer wrestles. I don't know what the deal with that is. I, I, I've heard some things. I don't know what's going on with his life. No, but, so no idea. So he's really not in production. Magnum CK had to retire, so now it's a three-man group. Yes, and it's, the only thing I knew was... None of us don't. We don't hate theater. We don't know theater. This yeah. group is about theater. Sure, it can't be because none of us care about theater or know about it. So you you guys all are self aware and realize. Like, yeah, and I was like, this well, this has to be something that's authentically us. And like, I know that they love B movies and like, um, you know, just really like gritty horror and all that type of. Those type of movies. So it kind of just evolved into a Grindhouse Films group. Yeah. And then, like, Snuff Films, sort of. Yeah. Which was when I was doing more serious stuff. And then it kind of developed. Yeah. Um, You've really taken off on your own, though, without the production, which is nice. And it's nice that you can do shows and you can team with Eddie. Or you can do shows and you can team with Derek. Because you can just... Th- like throw me back with them and it's yes, great yes but but it's great that like you could do all the single stuff and one of the most unique things about you which kind of goes back to the social media and the marketing like you you create your own videos and your content but i think one of the best things about you is your merchandise because as you know being in the wrestling industry sometimes either guys settle for parody shirts yes. or they have you're gonna the do worst a parody shirt you have to time. do it clever yes but like you have some really unique merchandise thank you and yeah, uh, i try uh like Describe some of your merchandise and what's the inspiration behind it. Uh, so I noticed that the more serious merchandise doesn't do as well. Most people, like, they're receptive to it, towards it, sort of. But if I have something that's kind of a mixture of, like, a scary, spooky, funny shirt, they like it more. Yeah. Which I do, too. It's visually more appealing. Um, so I just try to put out stuff that I would like to wear. I don't want to throw out something that just is thrown out to be thrown out. I agree. Because there's no point of that. Like, uh, there's a lot of bad merch out there. Yes. And I try to pride myself on having good-looking merch and unique merch. Like, yes. I saw the coffins and the candles and stuff like that. Yeah. So I try to keep it a little different so there's variety. And especially, like, you know, when you're getting into wrestling and especially when your character is, like, getting this buzz and growing, it's one of those things where it's, like, young guys need to understand that, like, 
you know, we're not going to talk about pay scales, but no, sometimes you're like, a business. You, you like you're, 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 you're growing as a character and yeah. like as a business. Right. And so like young guys need to understand that, like maybe you're, as you're starting out and you're developing your character, if you're getting paid X amount of dollars and it's not the best amount, because again, you're trying to like earn your spot as a performer and stuff. Merchandise is really key in terms yes. of like well, making I money. I feel like I remember as a new guy getting yelled at for having merch. That's unbelievable to me. Yeah, no, I'm pretty sure that was a thing. Was you shouldn't have merch because you're new. That's the dumbest thing I've ever Which heard. Which is in my stupid life. because that's always been my thing. Yeah. Of like, I make cool looking merch. Yeah. Like even back like when I first started, I feel like I had decent looking T-shirts. Yeah. Like my first shirt, I think was the Kid Gorgeous shirt. Yes. And then I think I did do a Judge ripoff shirt. I mean that's fine. But yeah, there was stuff like that. I did hardcore band ripoff shirts. Yeah. yeah. But still, like. Uh, yeah, I think I always remember that being looked down on when you first start. Yeah, I, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I, it probably goes back to those local guys who are just like, yes. brother. It's the same guys that, like, I hate that mindset when, like, new guys are in a battle royal and they go, oh, you're going to be getting a lot of chops tonight, and brother. Like, and why? they just want to beat up this kid. Yeah. Like, if the kid was a dick, okay, I guess. But, like, why, why are but you no beating up But no one ever is. It's always just a weird thing. Yeah, like, it's just like this dick measuring contest. Like, I'm going to beat up this kid. Like, it's stupid, right? Yes, I um, agree. I want to talk a lot about your Patreon because I think that goes well. It's a good segue with the merchandise. Yeah. I feel like you're one of the rare guys that does a Patreon very yeah. well because girls are very successful on the Patreon for obvious reasons. Um, I mean, they're much more attractive than we are. I mean, we're just... Wow, like, have you seen Danhausen? I, I, I mean, you're an attractive man. beautiful being on Earth. He's, he's, he's a pretty beautiful <laughs> being, but it's rougher for the guys with the Patreon. But I want to talk about your your love of music, which we haven't talked about. I just want to talk yeah. about that briefly. You're really you were really into the hardcore scene or like yeah 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 that's definitely what I grew up on like 14 through now I still like listen to it like we drove to Worcester Worcester Massachusetts Ohio? Worcester Massachusetts okay yeah. yeah to see Half Hard their reunion show oh wow for the 10 year and okay. it was great yeah um but I used to skip school and go see them oh, in like <laughs> Ohio at like yeah, Peabody's yeah. and stuff yes. and uh, what is it um I did a show there at the outside venue. AIW does their outside show there. I can't remember what it's oh, called. Oh, uh, it's it's class. Yes, now yes. that's class. I saw them there, and it was cool because I wrestled there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, I used to just not skip school all the time for that. But like those were like bands that I would just, like them and Bane and uh, all of those bands. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, now I kind of find myself more listening to like John Carpenter in the car. It's weird, right? How yes, your I listen to the changes. Halloween 2018 soundtrack a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not Halloween. It's usually like I listen to it in October, but I listen to it in October as much as I listen to it just every month. I listen to a lot of Nightmare on Elm Street music. Yeah, it's, it's just really it's weird. relaxing. Yeah. Uh, sometimes I listen to it at the gym, and I wonder if Why people not? can hear me. It, it's fine. Like sometimes, like I look so intense at the gym. Yeah. And I'm like not lifting heavyweight, but I'm there's a lot of intensity in what I'm doing. And yes. I, I'm thinking to myself, if only you knew that I'm listening to Bootylicious by yeah. Destiny's Child. No, no, no. I listen to a lot of. Uh, just s- not synth music, but kind of synth music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, And just weird, like, um, Kavinsky, which I think is what Joey Janela comes out to or did, that Protovision song. I believe uh, It's right. all the music from Drive. Yeah. All of that I love. It's just easy to listen to. It's good driving music. It's sometimes good workout music. What about Gunship? What is that? I don't know what that is. I've recently gotten into this band, Gunship. It's very, like, synthy. I'll, okay. I'll send you some stuff. It's really good. Um so Sort of almost like it sounds like a lot of Stranger Things inspired oh, okay, yeah, stuff. Yeah. You like Stranger Things? The music, yeah, yeah. The music, but the show. You watch the I show? It was too? okay. Uh, I feel like it was uh, overrated. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I take. watched the first season. I enjoyed it, but I also I think I only enjoyed it because it was October. Okay. So it was in. It was like on brand. All right. And I was like, it was new. And then I, the more I watched, I went. I really like the things this is ripping off and not giving credit to way more. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just in case you get severe backlash for hating Stranger Things. I, I don't hate it. Per, per, perhaps we need to edit this. So, like, let's pretend uh, you said you like yes, Stranger Yes, I love Things. Stranger Things. Big fan, huh? Big, huge fan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Never watched season two or three. Uh, I like the mullet guy. He's great. He was yeah. also in the new Power Rangers movie. Did you oh, see okay. the new no, Power I didn't Rangers see movie? that. Not bad. No. Not good. But it was good enough to where I was like, that's one of those things that didn't stick with me as an adult. Power Rangers? No, I have friends who like still like Power Rangers and everything. It's just one of those things I've like not carried over. Fair, fair. There's a few of those. I know like a lot of people still like Pokemon. I was never a Pokemon guy. I was, but like it's not a thing that I kept. That's okay. Yeah. No one's going to hold that against you. No. Well, people might. Okay. (laughs) 
I heard a little birdie though about about your musical taste and stuff. That uh, the little birdie told me that you may or may not be followed and follow back and exchange mes- messages with Corey Taylor. From oh Slipknot. yeah, Tell that's me about definitely that. uh, so. I posted. I went when I moved back home from Florida. I went through my closet and I found my eighth grade Slipknot T-shirts. <laughs> okay, so, so I took a picture. Okay. Yeah. So I had probably a shirt for every single day of the week of that band. Okay. Because I had three CDs. It was, I believe, Iowa, self-titled, and then I had Mar- Marilyn Manson, Hollywood. Okay. <laughs> Classic. And I would only listen to those three albums. Yeah. And usually only Slipknot over and over and over and over again. Okay. Uh, and then obviously when their new albums came out, I listened to those. But um, yeah, no, no. I posted a picture. He liked it. I think he retweeted it. And he might have followed me right after that. And then uh, I think he saw that I was a wrestler, and he's a huge wrestling fan. Yes. So I think he, like, I can't, I, I probably messaged him first and just said, hey, like, you're an inspiration because you kind of seem like you don't care and you just do what you want to do, and yes. that's what I want to do. Um, and he was very cool. He responded. We talked about wrestling a little bit. Uh, and then we just kind of, every once in a while, he'll comment on something of mine and say, hey, hope you're doing well. He's just super nice. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, great like when they're in town i get to go see them and it's cool so i yeah. get to be up close and be feel like i'm 12 years old like isn't that like but also strange, an adult still because i so, love them it's weird like uh we i don't think we got into this wrestling thing thinking that like oh we're gonna make friendships with like with people uh, that i lo- like i, I love them like they, they were my favorite yeah, thing like yes. not even just band i was just like i love the visuals of this i love they're all weird yeah like it just super weird like like you talk about slipknot like i'm really close friends with uh andy williams from Every oh Time yeah, I yeah I love obviously andy. he's in wrestling too yeah. but like you know i used to listen to him as a kid and yeah uh, no me too i remember sitting in accounting and listening to the new black yeah and now i'm like i yeah wrestle it, on shows with that man and talk so to him he's strange, great strange man and like i i've only over the past like eight-ish years really gotten into like uh, more sad boy music because yeah. you know it's some, easier to listen to it's yeah, easier on the ears you know and, and like like uh, 14 year old me would have made fun of uh, 33 year old me because he's like, Whatever. What are you doing, Greg? Because I was, I was a big new metal kid, and yeah, so, no, I was too, but yeah. like, so like now, like, I'm really into like uh, bands like State Champs or like Real Friends, yeah, and uh, Kyle from Real Friends is like a huge oh, okay. fan, and like now I always communicate with Kyle, yeah. and uh, he actually listens to a podcast, so if he's listening right now, hi, Kyle, how Hello, are you, Kyle? And it's just uh, it's super weird how like we could we took this stupid journey of like i'm gonna be a pro wrestler and then and then we, it just turns into being friends with people we're like, friends with people we look up to and we create these characters like, that really resonate with people uh one of the most i don't know maybe i've said it before i don't think so though like i always feel weird talking about it but like i met mick foley and i got to hang out with mick foley for a decent amount of time which was crazy because it's mick foley yeah like we i ran his mer- uh merch table his autograph booth when i was living in florida because it helped with the conventions and everything. So, like, okay. I've kept in contact with him. And, like, just crazy. I ate uh, lunch catering with Mick Foley and the guy who does the Mario voice. But, like, it was oh, just wow. me sitting at <laughs> a table with Mick Foley for eight hours a day talking to him. And I was like, this is... Well, like, there would be moments where I would look at him and go, I'm having a conversation with Mick Foley. Yeah, yeah, Like, and oh, I'm you're like, just a... I'm talking to you like a dude, but you're but not just a you're, dude. You're not just a dude. You're, yeah. like, you're actually... You're a legend. Like, and it was one of those situations where, like, you're not supposed to meet people that you look up to or whatever. I was like, no, no, no. He's great. Yeah. Like, uh, he's always been super helpful and offers advice. He, every once in a while, he'll, he'll also just check in and see how I'm doing, and it's super cool. It's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. I... um. You know, you mentioned how you immediately messaged Corey. You yes. slid in his DMs, yeah. right? So a few years back, I got a follow from what I thought was an Edge fan account. Oh, it was really Edge? It was really Edge, nice. okay? And so I had met him a couple weeks earlier. Just a random thing. He showed up to a show in upstate New York with Tommy Dreamer. Okay. Real close. He watched my match, and, like, I had some conversation with him. And then all of a sudden, I get this follow two weeks later. So me being a huge Edge fan, I was like, oh, shit. Like, I'm just going to slide into the DMs down yeah. there see it's actually it. So I'm like, hey, thanks so much for following me. Like, uh, you've always been a big inspiration, blah, blah, blah. Like, such a huge fan. Like, thank you. And he wrote me back, and he said, great meeting you. After watching you wrestle, I, I became a fan of you. And it's like, 
That's oh, crazy. Brain explodes because it's just like it's awesome, dude. Like what? What is life? Like we were able to create these like incredible surreal moments just because we we took this risk of like following our dreams and like yep. putting ourselves out there and doing this. And then you stupid meet people that wrestling. you looked up to. Yeah, which is it's, it's wild. It's amazing. So, um, you've created this incredible character that people are emotionally invested in, and I feel like you've hit a lot of your goals this year. Yeah, I've hit. A, I've, I think I've hit a decent amount of them. What are you looking to do next year, 2020? Overseas. Yeah, I would like to go to the UK. Mm-hmm. Uh, wherever else it'll take me. Sure. Um, West Coast. Yeah. I've never wrestled in California. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, maybe just like if I can, a couple TV wrestling matches would be cool. Yeah, that'd be to cool. To do just for whatever exposure, so I can yell things into the camera that people will see on live television. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that'd be awesome, right? <laughs> Just slip in stupid uh, Danhausenisms. Yes, which With Hausen at the end, of course. Yes, yes, absolutely. That's what I try to do uh, for IWTV all the time. I look in the camera and I say something stupid. Yes, and I don't know if it ever gets caught, but Whatever. I hope it does. It's worth a shot, right? Exactly. Uh, I'm gonna run through some quick uh, questions. Yeah. And just tell me uh, whatever pops in your head. Yeah. Um, what's your worst payday in wrestling that wasn't nothing? Oh, it was like $11. Okay. It was is- specifically like $11. <laughs> so, okay. What's the trip look like? How long is the journey? Oh, it was only like a 40 minute drive. Okay. But I was like, why wouldn't you just give me $10 <laughs> or, 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 bump it up to or 15? 15? Like yeah. it was either 11 or $13. Okay. I can't remember, but I was just like, this is very strange. Uh, <laughs> there was that. And I think I got paid like 11 or 12 bucks to drive like three hours once. And I was like, don't even who cares? Oh, horrible. Uh, Worst job before wrestling? Ooh. Um, maybe Panera Bread. It was always busy, and everybody was always mean. Makes sense. Yeah. De- dealing with the public is horrible. Yes. Longest drive for wrestling? Oh, uh, ooh, Texas. Um, you drove to Texas? Yes. I've driven to Texas like two or three times. That's insane. Uh, one time, Jason Cade and Matt Palmer made me listen to the Buffy musical <laughs> for almost the whole time. Okay. And then the other time was with Angelus Lane and our car's tire busted in Alabama, I think it was. Okay. And we missed a show the first day. And then we made it to Inspire the next day, but wow, it was the worst. Driving there was the worst. Jesus. It's such a long drive. Best friend in wrestling. Ooh. Uh, I would say Effie. That's a good yeah. choice. Yeah. Good dude, man. Love Effie. Such a good dude. Um What's your best opponent or match? Hmm. I would so... That's hard because uh, I would say the match that kicked off this character and got me a lot of notice was Effie because that was the first time I did the teeth with everything. Okay. Uh, he also was the first person to be like, hey, do all your weird stuff with me. And yeah. just let me do it because he trusted me. We've known each other forever. Yeah. Uh, so that's probably the most important match that I've had. Uh, I wrestled Matt Justice for j Lit, And that was like a... Hey, Dan Housen's been doing this weird stuff, and that was my first like, oh, he can do an actual like wrestling match, match, and I think yes. that's what won me over with the crowd, gotcha. like ultimately. So I would say that's probably right up there. Favorite wrestling shirt of all time could be WWF, could be an independent Ooh. wrestling shirt. Uh, I have the CM Punk uh, Ringer shirt from when he came back, 2011. Yes, Summer of Punk. Yep, Summer yes. of Punk shirt, the white one with Classic. the yep. That's, I think it's my favorite shirt. I still have it. It's one of the only like WWE wrestling shirts that I have still are a few CM Punk shirts. We, I feel like we've talked, we've talked for an hour. We've barely touched on like the subject of actual wrestling, which is crazy. Yeah. yeah. Five guys that you really were inspired by coming up as a kid. Like as a, as a wrestling yeah, you're fan? Yeah, just, just a big fan of, yeah. Maybe let, let's, let's go with three guys that you, were, you liked as a fan and three guys that inspire you as a performer today. Okay, so definitely Kane as a yep. kid. Stone Cold, Shawn Michaels, I would say. And I would say ultimately, like, Punk was what got me back into wrestling. Yeah. Was CM Punk, so I still do the go to sleep sometimes. Gotcha. Uh, but definitely him, definitely Daniel Bryan. Because that was like, oh, it was all around the same time. Those guys were like just getting popular. Sure. And I think Cesaro had just gotten signed. But I love Dolph Ziggler. He's great. Yeah. Uh, he was def- like he was one of my favorites. He was like, those are my top three in like 2011, which was right around when I was training. Mm-hmm. And I was like, whoa, I really like uh, CM Punk because he's all the hardcore stuff. And I really related to that. Yeah. Uh, and then just 
Daniel Bryan is so good. And also, he's a weirdo. Like <laughs> he's a different he, cat. He, I love it. He talked about ants for like thirty minutes on Jimmy Jacobs' podcast. <laughs> yeah, I heard that. And actually. I want to hear him talk about ants more. I don't yeah. know why. I shouldn't. <laughs> it's just no intriguing. one should want to hear about anyway. Talk about ants. <laughs> but I now I know about them and their tunnels from Tennessee and I love them. Hey man, uh, that and Sami Zayn. He's great. Sami Zayn is, uh, I think, maybe the best wrestler on the roster, and he's just. And I think they're not doing great. anything with him. And he is so nice. Yeah, incredible uh, human. Yep. Uh, he was another guy who just like inspired me because I drove to an Evolve tryout and he was just standing watching wrestling. I think Chris Dickinson was wrestling. This is all I remember. And he was just super nice. He said, do every show. He said, do the shitty shows. They're going to shape you. He's like, do every single show you can. He's like, don't get hurt, but do the shitty shows, do the good shows, do the spot shows, do the fun shows, do the bad shows. doesn't matter. Do them all. Yes. Very good advice. Yeah. Sound. Uh, Do you have a hidden talent? that someone might not know about you? Uh, I can draw if I try to. Okay. Um, And I can drum. You can drum. Did you play in any bands? Nah, not really. A couple, like, crappy hardcore bands here and there. Nothing, like, only, like, one show, and then we were done. Okay. Uh, The only thing we did was played with A Day to Remember before they became popular. That's pretty sweet. They were kind of popular, but it was, like, they were getting paid, like, 100 bucks at the time. That's how, like, relevant they were at the time. Yeah, that's crazy. they're, like, stadium show guys. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. I love A Day to Remember. Yeah. Um, what's your biggest fear? Ooh, it's deep, right? Yeah, kind of deep this is right deep. Now. Tornadoes yeah. when I was a kid. <laughs> okay, there was a lot of tornado warnings around. Terrifying, here. and if you saw Twister, you oh, know, I, you, I love Twister now. Fun, scary. Fun fact: first movie ever released on DVD, Twister. Oh, why do I really? know that? Don't know. Bill Paxton. Yes. Uh, so actually, <laughs> things that are really, really big, like tornadoes yes, uh, or the ocean, big. scares me. Uh huh. Uh, I'll weird. go in it, but it scares me because there are giant things in there that I can't see. And, and you know, something that Ricky Shane Page always says is like, we don't, we haven't even gone like no. uh, a large percentage of how far deep the ocean no, goes. It is, I, I hate it. Who the fuck knows what? I hate it. There. I hate that picture where it shows the depth. Oh yeah, and it's just all Terrifying. darkness. Oh yeah, for like. I don't know how many miles, and I'm yeah, like, yeah. there's monsters. There has yeah. to be monsters. What's that? What's that movie that came out a couple years ago where it's like, uh, the, I don't know if you saw it. They put the girls in a shark cage, oh. and swim with sharks, and then like the the chain breaks and they get like Did trapped they just fall? in the oh, shark. Oh god, that's oh. awful. Terrifying, right? Yeah, super scary. I can't remember the name. Yeah, of the movie, no, it's, it's anything awful. like that, or like even weird fake things like uh, the mist at the end of it. There's that giant <laughs> monster just in the sky that you <laughs> yeah. kind of can't see. I was like, that's terrifying. I hate it. <laughs> like when I'm driving through places like Pennsylvania and the mountains, or like uh, Vermont or anything. Yeah, there's mountains that are covered with smoke and fog, and I'm just like. I hate this. Yeah. There's things up there I know there are. Terrifying. Yeah. I think I know the answer to this. Best moment of your life thus far. Thus far. Yeah. Meeting my wife. Yeah. Yeah. I figured you'd go there. Yeah, yeah. She looks like a beautiful woman. I've never she's met her. She's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, she's very cool. She's a burlesque dancer. Yeah. So we're both weird. Mm-hmm. She does a lot of... Uh, horror inspired and spooky things so she's got like a spider act she has a blood act where she just covers herself in blood yeah uh, which maybe people will be seeing around wrestlemania time oh okay. hint hint Ooh. uh yeah so no definitely meeting her has been the best uh awesome. personal like yeah love man N- nothing better it's a powerful thing um I get to take a train tomorrow to see her. Yes, yes. <laughs> I, you, you are sacrificing sleep to sit here with For me. For the podcast. And t- do a podcast. And I appreciate that. It's actually funny because if you go back and listen to the other podcast, I'm somehow like finagling and taking something away from everybody uh, in an effort to do an hour-long podcast. Well, you whatever. know, sometimes you have to. I guess. You can sleep <laughs> on the train, right? Yeah, exactly. It's a long one. Uh, final question, I yes. guess. Yes. Uh, what inspires you? What keeps you going when it comes to professional wrestling and life in general? Life in general is my wife. Yeah. And even wrestling, she inspires me because she'll tell me, hey, you should really do this and push me along to do something. Um, and just, this is going to sound cheesy, but like the fans. It's not cheesy. The fans are so nice to me. Yeah. And without them, the Dan Housen character wouldn't work at all. For sure. It would just be some weird idiot. <laughs> <laughs> dancing to Pee Wee Herman songs, tequila, <laughs> yeah. to nothing. Yeah. Because they sing along and make me look not stupid. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, if I yelled, who do you love, and no one says anything, I look like an asshole. Super awkward. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, no, they're always great. They always come up and talk to me. It's, like, I, I, I think some of them think they're annoying me. No one's annoying me. Yeah. You're all great. Yeah. 
All the Housens. <laughs> All the Housens. There's too many of them. The uh, Fan Housens. The Fan Housens. Yes. Yeah, it's been wonderful. Where? I laughed so hard because Trent replied to somebody and just popped up on my feed. Yeah. And it just said, there are too many Housens. And I started laughing because I wasn't tagged in it. I just happened to see it. Yeah, yeah, And I started laughing so hard. I wonder if you even knew. Like, I don't think you knew. But then I like quote tweeted and I was like, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> so you knew where it was coming from at least. Oh, my God. Tremendous. Well, I don't know. I'm going to let you get some sleep, but uh, where can people find you on social media? Uh, Dan Housen AD yes. on, I think, everything. I think Instagram and Twitter. I kind of keep Facebook just for me now. Yeah. Uh, I'll, like, add promoters and wrestlers, but I kind of just keep that separate. What do you offer on the Patreon? Oh, uh, Review Housen, which is Dan Housen trying popular human foods for the first time. <laughs> okay. Uh we have Good Night Housen with Dan Housen, which actually, if you were a fan of the ROH interviews I did, or if you hated them, whatever, uh, I think most people like them. Uh, that's me reviewing just independent wrestlers that people like. I just have people, every, if I have time, I interview them. Um, and then I have uh, Dining with Dan Housen, which is the Dan Housen cooking show, where I cook uh, various things. I think I did spaghetti and meatballs. <laughs> I have pizza coming up. It'll just be ridiculous stuff. And then I just do whatever various content. Like, I'll try to post a picture and I'll put a story from the weekend. Okay. So that way it's not just, if I'm on Twitter, I'm just posting Dan Housen and stuff. Yeah, this yeah. is more personal. Uh, I'll post, like, a picture from the show, but I'll also post a story of my weekend. So it's just a little bit more of a look into my life. Gotcha. And an actual, like, personal, you know tale for you to hear yeah and i think everyone should invest in it or else they're a uh, dumbass housing oh Does no that that's no swearing oh so, god <laughs> damn it oh yeah no swearing Fuck. oh god i feel like we should just wrap swearing this up. is very bad you're gonna take it off the air i'm sorry yeah oh god I'm just <laughs> all right well thank you for your time good night housing <laughs> everyone knows that i love good vintage wrestling merch but when i want the best of the best when it comes to finding vintage wrestling memorabilia I go to the Savage Stash. The Savage Stash is your wheeler and dealer for the best in vintage wrestling shirts, hats, jackets, accessories, and everything in between. I've picked up some of my all-time favorite vintage items from the Savage Stash, and that's including the original Hunter Hearst Helmsley How to Be a Snob Tee from 1995, and I've never seen that anywhere else online. And just last year... I picked up a vintage 1996 WWF Royal Rumble tee that I gifted to Johnny Gargano for his birthday. It was in mint condition, and I'm telling you, Johnny could not have been happier when he opened that up because I know the Royal Rumble in 96 meant a lot to him with Shawn Michaels winning and everything. I've also got a wide variety of fanny packs from the Savage Dash over the years, including a rare WWF Championship fanny pack from 1991, and of course, their ultra-stylish green and purple three-pocket Savage Dash fanny pack that I used to store all of my goodies when I'm on the road. Right now on SavageDash.com, they're selling exclusive Intercontinental Championship pins with interchangeable white and black straps. You can get black or white strap alone for 10 bucks, the black or the white strap with the plate for $20, or you can get both straps and the plate for just $30. That's right, $30. And if you're buying this pin or any other fanny packs, hats, or vintage merch at TheSavageDash.com, you can use promo code IRON, I-R-O-N, at checkout to save 10% on your order. That's right. It's an exclusive offer to listeners of Iron On Wrestling. If you go to thesavagestash.com and buy any items at all and use the promo code IRON, the Savage Stash will take 10% off your entire order. To see all of their current or past items, go to www.thesavagestash.com, follow them at the Savage Stash on Twitter or Instagram, and like them on Facebook at the Savage Dash. Hey, what are you waiting for? If you're looking for the best in vintage merch, go to the place that can't be topped. Check out the Savage Dash, the absolute cream of the crop. Oh, yeah. That was the interview with Dan Housen, and now... Yeah, it was. A lot of pressure's on for you, Aaron, because right. somehow in nine episodes, this will be the ninth time, Ooh. Uh, you've managed to not never get three things right about That's the people a double that negative. we interview. That's a double negative. You're a double negative. You said not negative, or not now, or not never. Listen, you son of a bitch. Yeah. You can't get three things right from yep. any interview that we've ever Well, done. I got it today, brother. Brother. You, you have it today, okay? Oh, yeah. That means you had to, like, listen, 
and pay attention to the entire interview. You keep talking. And and look, you're you're distracting me from what I need to do. With the pressure on, Aaron. Yeah. Three things that you learned about Dan Housen after this week's episode. And go. Okay. Number one, he was trained by Jim, Jimmy Jacobs. He was. One True of the uh, greatest minds in professional wrestling. Yeah. I like him. Came up with the list. He did. Yes. Number two, <laughs> he's followed by Corey Taylor of Slipknot. Yeah, lead singer of Slipknot. That's yeah, cool. one of uh, my favorite bands of all time. Oh, yeah? Name name uh, two songs by Slipknot. Um, my Sacrifice <laughs> and My Way or the Highway. <laughs> you know, um, a lot of people commonly confuse Corey Taylor and Scott Stapp. <laughs> Uh, never. Well, I have. It's it's a it's it's something that happens all the time, and I could see where you would think that Creed was Slipknot. But the third thing, third thing that you learned about Dan Housen today. Oh, definitely. And I got this one that he was inspired for his character uh, by Bad News Brown. And, and, and hold on, before you correct me, it was a mixture of Bad News Brown and Rick. The model Martel. You know, somehow, I didn't think it was possible. I feel like that's the worst. Dun, 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 dun. <clears throat> Is that the Rick Martel song? Dun, 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 dun. I don't feel like that sounds like it at all. Somehow, though, <laughs> you managed to think of a worse combination than Hulk Hogan and Taz for a character. Rick Martel and Bad News Brown. I will hit you with the Ghetto Blaster and then put you in the Boston Crab. Would it be like the arrogant Ghetto Blaster? Be the the arrow blaster. Okay. Well, you're an actual moron, and uh, we're just about out of time for this week. But next week, the ghetto arrogant. Calm down. The ghetto crab. No. The Boston blaster. I want to talk about next week. Oh yeah, let me hear. Because next week is. I can't wait. A time for thanks, a time for giving. In fact, you might say, some people may call it Thanksgiving. And our episode will air on Thanksgiving Eve because we air every Wednesday. And before I tell you or allude to who's going to be on the podcast, I have to tell you we are on social media at Iron On Wrestling. You can follow us on Instagram, Twitter. You can like us on Facebook. And you know what? You can download the podcast on iTunes or any major podcasting, uh, downloading, website thingamabob. That's the technical term. And you should give us five stars. And a comment on iTunes. We get to You're doing a great job, but I tell you what, I'm so sick of the social media stuff. <laughs> okay. Look, you're always pushing me. I just, it, how long did it take me to post a story to Instagram? You started posting a story to Instagram yesterday, and uh, <laughs> it just now uploaded it today. <laughs> real bad, real bad. And I'm sure it won't be there by Wednesday when this drops. Well, but either way, stories just last Instagram 24 me. hours. You don't even know how fucking stories work. They, nope, they last I have no idea. Hours. So, yes, it won't be there by Wednesday when this is aired. So I'm going to have to upload a new story? <laughs> yes, they're temporary They're temporary things that you upload. Well, here, if you don't tune in for anything else, just tune in to see if I upload a new story by Wednesday. A-A-R, Force, W-O-N? Correct. All right, that's where I'm at on the Instagram. We're going to focus on that for me this week. Follow me on Twitter, at Gregory Iron, at Instagram, uh, at on Instagram. (laughs) What an idiot. Okay. (laughs) Follow me on Instagram, at Gregory underscore Iron, where I post stories that I know because I'm in touch with. uh, Like my story on it. (laughs) You can't like stories. You're you're a fucking 60-year-old man. I hate you. At Gregory underscore Iron. (laughs) Facebook, Gregory Iron. Favorite my tweet. Contact me. You don't know what you're doing. Contact me for... Speaking engagements, professional wrestling yes. at my website, www.gregory-iron.com. I've got shirts over on prowrestlingtees.com backslash Gregory Iron. And make sure you download the podcast on iTunes. Leave us a five-star review and a comment. It helps us move up the chart. People know that we exist, and we thank you for doing so. And uh, next week, the guest. Yes. Guess what? I'm what? not going to tell you who the guest is. Why? But I will allude to who he is. Can we cue the... Ominous music in the background. 
Oh, it's Money, getting, Money. It's, it's getting real. So, oh, that's that's sort of a teaser. But this person that's going to be on the podcast, uh, it kind of goes in sync with the Thanksgiving Eve tradition. In fact, uh, he sort of came to prominence around the Thanksgiving time of the year. Some might say that he's Don't. from the uh, he's from the dark side. Uh, you might say that he is. Um, why are you laughing? You might say it's, that you might. It's not the Undertaker. You might. Let's, 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 let's just make it clear right now. It ain't the Undertaker. He, he's a dead man of sorts. It, it might be a Taker, he, but it ain't an Undertaker. It's we do have a Taker, maybe next week. That's that's all I can tell you. What I can tell you is, as the week progresses, we will slowly reveal who this person is. Every Monday, we tell you who the next guest is for sure on social media. We've been usually telling you at the end of the episode, but I feel like. You're going to have to follow the Iron on Wrestling accounts. Let's have fun with this one. You're going to have to follow the Iron on Wrestling accounts to find out who the guest is on Thanksgiving Eve next Wednesday. But he is, um, he's a scary man. Everybody's uh, got a price. That's true. And, uh. Everybody's going to pay. That's, that's very much true. So next week we have a very special guest. Yeah! (laughs) Okay, see. Is that more Jim Neidhart than Ted DiBiase? I don't know. Uh, I don't know where I'm at. Yeah. This, this outro is going too long. Let's take it home. Hey, <laughs> tune in next week. Tune in every week. Download some old episodes. We got some great content. We'll go ha- have some uh, even better content for you next week. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe even some controversial content. Quite frankly, because uh, this is a controversial man. So uh, until then, hey, see you next time. Bye.